The following conversation is with my very good friend Tomor Parat. We get deep into the philosophical, psychological, and human behavior weeds. We talk about, if you're interested in these conversations that go all over on these topics, then you'll enjoy this conversation. We talk about fear and overcoming fear. We talk about our time and how we met in Singapore on exchange and why that experience was so valuable to us. We talk about linking identity as a human being to work. We talk about finding meaning in life, finding enjoyment in life, how to balance the two. We talk about all the different lessons and how different the lessons are of people learning through this year and through the pandemic. Uh, We talk about finances and economics and what we have learned throughout our life in attaining financial and economical uh, stability. The ramifications of intent and harming others, social media addictions and liability of certain businesses to hold themselves responsible for social media. Uh, We talk about the mammalian old, million old brain and how it's adapted to modern lifestyle. We talk about genetics, survival, natural selection, reproduction, and how that ties into things like Neuralink and all the, the interesting things that Elon is doing and how that ties into human pain and suffering. If you like conversations that get deep into questioning, critically thinking, and understanding different interesting perspectives, then I imagine you will really enjoy this conversation, one of many that we will have in the future. I hope you enjoy. What's your go-to cereal again? Uh, just the like standard brand flakes, you know, the brown ones. Oh, yeah, that, that's, that's not too exciting <laughs> though. That's the most disappointing. <laughs> It feels good though, you know. You like it? Like it nice says, satisfies you? Yeah, yeah. But I haven't had it in since probably a couple months after coming back from Singapore. Let's take him back there, right? Do you remember how we met? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. The moment? Sure. You want to tell that story? Yeah, sure. All right. So uh, I think it was on the 8th of August, 2019. Whoa. Yeah. So we met on the 8th of August. I really wanted to meet people at the orientation. And so uh, I left and then um, I saw some people I met the day before, but I wanted to meet some new people. So I kind of lapped a couple groups. And just a couple months prior, I met some of like my best friends who were Australians. And then I hear you, Alex, uh, you, Alex, uh, you, Pete, uh, Mary, and Marin with your like nice Melbourne Australian accent. I'm like, what could go wrong? Uh, Everything. Yeah. And then I... And then I came up to you first, actually, and I just introduced myself, and uh, and that was the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Absolutely. And now, yeah. Now we're here. But why did you decide to come up to us? Was it just the accents? I know you were trying to meet people. You like, were you yeah. forcing yourself to approach people? One hundred percent. Yeah, it was actually uh, like a little nerve wracking, mm. a little bit. You know that? Uh, I, it's definitely something I've tried to do a lot before uh but every single time it's always like, oh okay let's do it i i think i went to get like i don't know if you remember they had like those big jugs of like that tea and water and juice i got like three cups of juice just going around and i'm like okay let's go let's do it you're not leaving without talking to someone for sure um uh, and then yeah it was mainly just because i couldn't really judge them by anything else i was like i met some great australian people a couple months ago let's go for let's go talk to some australians but can you imagine like if because i've been in so many situations in my life where i've let fear drive my decision making or anxiety or social like anxiety right i've I've had that right especially uh, approaching the opposite sex right dating when you're younger for sure and you know, there's this famous Will Smith quote. It's like, fear, when you experience fear, you can't really fully experience beauty and see beauty, right? And that's, that's like, applicable to, like, when you're fearful of, like, heights, for example, and you're in this beautiful landscape. But it's like, when you experience fear, it's like, it, it either cripples you into being, like, static, or it just pushes you through into momentum. Yeah. No, I definitely agree it's it's i could definitely link back some of my most incredible experiences Mm -hmm. and also socially speaking like mainly socially speaking actually like friendships to points where i pushed myself just like 
past that point. Have you ever had like anything like that that you can specifically recall? Hey, because of because I faced my fear, I got that. Or I got mm, this. I know I've got stories. Um, damn. Do you have one off top? Yeah, yeah. But that's because that's because I I, I really like to use it in, as an example to encourage. T- people tell to me, and maybe I'll think of something. Well, I mean, okay. So first of all, like us, I think is a great example, yeah. and. Uh, you know, from that, we also got just the whole No Spice group, which yeah. I think is incredible. Do you want to explain but what that also... is? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For the audience at home. Uh, yeah, so uh, Alexander and I met with a couple other people. Uh, and then over the course of a couple of days, we kind of con- accumulated about 14 other people. Bro, it's crazy. Uh, Never in yeah. my life. <laughs> Never. I would... If there's one thing I can take from shitty Singapore, no disrespect, Singapore, please don't come <laughs> and get me. Um, don't pain them. It, yeah. It's... It's that super family we created that turned into like 15 people, like this mini tribe, but I'm like, humans are so tribal and I never felt yeah. that more experienced in my life than what we created and i'll look back on those experiences with such fond memories for a long time definitely definitely it's i learned so much from that as well because you know how often do you actually get to have a a solid consistent tight group of that many people uh just hanging out with each other all the time so it's very it was very interesting to me to kind of see the social dynamics what works what doesn't work um so that isn't i think an excellent example of uh you know facing your fears but also uh one of my favorites uh was this was probably two two and a half years ago at this point and i went to this party this this was pre-covid and it was just like an uh also for incoming exchange students to amsterdam so i went to this party met a couple friends there we had a good time i was just leaving and this other girl was leaving and she was like saying bye to all her friends and i was like ah can i swear on this yeah, yeah bro. you can say <laughs> like, whatever you want. <laughs> uh, and then I, I went up to her and I was like, bye. <clears throat> As she was like saying bye to all her friends. And she was like, bye, it was so nice too. And then she was like, wait, I don't know you. We were both like half drunk. And I was like, no, you don't. And then I left. Uh, it, it, was, it wasn't like a throw a smoke bomb and I just, it was just like, okay, bye. Yeah. Um, anyways, a couple weeks go by and university started. This was right before uh, the start of the academic year. And I'm um, sitting next to my friend that I've been with like throughout my whole bachelor's and I ask her like, do we, that girl right there that came into the lecture hall, do we recognize her? Because she knows everyone. I know, like we all know, my friend and I, we both know each other's friends like really well. Like I'm like, we definitely met her at some point. And I couldn't remember where I met her. Um, so like the next week I went up to her and I was like, hey, did we meet at some point? And then I heard her speak and I was like, oh yeah, you're the girl whose name starts with H. I, I remembered by her accent. And that was the girl from the party that I just said bye to. Anyways, fast forward another two weeks, uh, her and my group of friends become friends, and she also brings another friend of hers. Uh, so that was Hannah and Amy. That are, those are their names. Uh, we become very good friends for the whole semester that they're in Amsterdam. They leave. And right before they leave, Amy is Australian, by the way, uh, and which leads us to actually meeting you eventually. Um, Right before they leave, Amy says, hey, I've got a friend coming uh, next semester. Can I give her your number just, you know, in case she, you know, wants anything or whatever? I was like, yeah, for sure, definitely. Fast forward to next semester. I didn't get any messages or anything, but I'm leaving class and I hear a girl talking in an Australian accent saying that she's from Eastern Australia, which is where Amy's from, studying whatever Amy was studying. And I was like, no way, no way that's her. And so... Uh, literally in my mind, I was right behind her. Uh, and I was like, okay, I need to go to the building on the left. If she goes left, I'll go up to her and like ask her if it's her. Cause it's like a really weird thing to ask. And so she turned left and I was like, okay, damn. You gotta so <laughs> yeah, I literally followed her uh, and I had to walk really fast. It was, uh, very creepy. Uh, and I go up to her, I'm like, Hey, are you from, from, uh, uh, like this place in Australia? And she was like, no, but that's really close to where I live. And I'm like, ah, oh, okay, never mind. I just had like this friend last semester, and she was like, Amy, and I was like, yeah. Anyways, so that was Belle. Belle and I end up becoming incredible you, friends. You better have married this woman with this story. <laughs> <laughs> but 
<laughs> Belle and I end up becoming incredible friends. Through Belle, I meet another two uh, friends of hers, also from Australia, actually, uh, Emma and Alex. Uh, and we become very good friends. And, you know, I in Singapore, when I went to Australia, I went and stayed at all their places. Mm. They showed me around. And, you know, I, I got these such fulfilling, beautiful friendships just from that one moment two years ago when I hugged a random girl. Wow. Like, so that was almost like a seed that turned into all these other interactions and friendships. Yeah, exactly. A catalyst. And I think it's... Exactly. For me, it's such like a beautiful thing to look at because it's so easy for me to see that chain, that link between every point. Uh, and it all, yeah, exactly, catalyzed itself from the moment I just randomly said bye to this girl. But can you... Can you now imagine all the times we and people let fear take them away from what those opportunities could be in their life? Right, right. No, I, I mean, and I've done that too. I'm sure you have as well. Like it's, it's crazy to think about what we, what we miss out on. But also, I think, you know, just doing it uh, and seeing what you got out of that is really incredible. Yeah. But yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. I wanted to ask you because mm -hmm. when we were talking, you said, and this is going to be the opportunity to now speak about it because I wanted to ask you, you yeah. said this whole period you've been really enjoying. Like this this 2020 yeah. year, you have been yeah. quite enjoying. Actually, do you mind closing the blind behind you? I'm getting some glare. I want, oh, to, sure. see, I want to see your beautiful oh, yeah. red oh. hair and your, your beautiful oh. beard. I don't hear. I don't hear that enough. Yeah, well, there you go. You, you gotta, you gotta go. walk with the blinds closed behind you more. <laughs> you know. I know it's uh, it's crazy. I don't know why I take the blinds with me outside, but Absolutely. maybe I gotta stop doing that. I gotta stop doing that. No, but uh, you said you'd be really enjoying this year, and yeah. I think you feel guilty for. I heard you say you almost feel guilty for saying it, yeah. and I felt what you felt before. Yeah. Can you now explain what you mean and why you're enjoying it? Yes. For sure. So uh, to be more specific, I've really enjoyed the lockdown period. Uh, so, you know. Oh, so you haven't moving. enjoyed hundreds of thousands of people dying? Oh, my bad. <laughs> yeah. My bad, bro. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for clarifying. Just got you know, I, I, I... <laughs> yeah, no. Definitely not. Definitely not. Um, and so, you know, I, here in the Netherlands, I think it started, I don't know, probably around the end of February, early March is when we started kind of taking it more seriously. And uh, yeah, no, it's just been an incredible experience uh, because, you know, you it's this period of time where you get to be completely by yourself, you know, to the degree that you want to. Um, the whole world shut down, you know, you're if you think about it as a metaphor, you know, some people say you're you're walking on a, you know, what do they call it on a fast on those things at the airport, you know, that kind of yeah, take you. Yeah, we call it. Um, I, I, forget, yeah, I forget the yeah I forget I forget the name for that. But you know they say you're walking on one that's going backwards and you got to run forward to like move. Okay. Do you know the metaphor I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay. And so I feel like uh, when the whole world shut down, it kind of everything, you know, there was no rush. You didn't have to hustle. You didn't have to run to places. You didn't have to do this. You didn't have to do that. And you got an excellent opportunity to kind of at least for me to just sit with yourself and see how you react to being socially isolated, physically at least. Uh, you know, seeing how you react to not having to go to a party every whenever you want to go or not having to feel that you need to meet up with friends. That was a big one. Uh, just seeing how you handle the situation. I think it's an... How... When else can you experience that again in your life? I think it's an incredible privilege, actually to be able to have been given the opportunity to experience a world that was shut down for a couple months. Would you call it, it's like a gift to experience that social isolation? Or is it that yeah, not the part of yeah. it? No, it's definitely social isolation too, because I, you know, one of the things I learned is that I'm a lot more introverted than I thought I was. And what I didn't realize I was doing beforehand, uh, which I think is something to be really grateful for that, ha you know, with this situation, this global situation, this global pandemic, which is absolutely horrible, 
you know, I think, let me make that clear, I really am not happy with what is going on globally and, you know, all the people that are dying and people losing their jobs and it's, it's horrible. Um, and yeah, what I, what I also kept on saying earlier is that I think we are very lucky to have been able to experience this pandemic at the age that we are yeah. without of having to take care of a family, without of really needing that income to survive. Um, but yeah, so in the first couple of years of uni, I was just kind of going to all these parties, all these events, all these social gatherings. Uh, unbeknownst to me, I didn't even want to. Uh, I kind of just, it was kind of like an automatic, oh, there's a party, oh, okay. Is I, that what I, you I'm mean with the wa the walker escalators in the airport? You were just riding a momentum? Could that be another? Uh, that was more like uh, with regards to work. Right. Um, and so uh, with, you know, maybe for me it was also different because uh, I was really free those couple of months. I didn't have any university work. I wasn't... Um, doing any internships i was still tutoring which is some probably you know i don't know something like 15 to 20 hours a week but that was that was about it and so i had this incredible time of just complete peace hmm. of not i didn't feel like i needed to get an internship i didn't feel like i needed to up how much i worked i felt very comfortable just sitting and looking inside and just being with myself and trying to understand I guess me, hmm. uh, as opposed to, and like right before everything got shut down. So January, February, I was, you know, ravaging the, the internet to find like an, a good internship to start. And, you know, there was always that drive to do more and more and more, which I think is good to an extent, but, uh, you know, I also feel very grateful that that was kind of put on hold, at least from the way I perceived it for a couple months. So I could really just take it all in does that make sense yeah it's almost like it gave you space this forced involuntary situation gave you space away from the chaos which gave you perspective and maybe some inner clarity and self-awareness i think yeah i think that's an excellent way to put it yeah i think it definitely gave me some space to breathe and just kind of yeah just exactly understand what's going on, some self-respect, yeah, have some perspective. It's interesting to see, though, how many people are struggling without... It's like, it's, it's like the curtains have been opened, right? The skin has been taken off the body, and I can see, or even that I can see their organs now. Like, you can... You're, right. you're vulnerable <clears throat> to yourself. They took off the mask. They took up. Yeah. Hey, we got volunt We have we we have to keep the masks on here in Melbourne, but they took off the masks <laughs> metaphorically, and a lot of people are struggling really hard because I don't think they're comfortable with what they see behind that mask, mm. Mm. and they attach themselves. I think a lot of people have attached their identity to their work. It's like, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just. Uh, this has been a recent kind of uh, thought process of mine for the past couple weeks. Yeah. Uh, since now I actually started university, started my master's, and I started an internship. So now I'm, it's kind of like a 180 of COVID, like proper peak COVID period, in a great way though. Um, but that's, that's a different story. And I was thinking about how much our lives as human beings is centered around work. Hmm. I think it's absolutely baffling. You know, like if you think about just a standard employee working nine to five, right? And so, you, you know, discount all the people who work in like the finance industry, investment banking, working, you know, 12, 13 hour days for I don't know how many years, just working nine to five, you know, take in on average, I don't know what the average commute is, 30 minutes there and back, maybe an hour, mm. you know, you know, before you know it, that's almost half your day, way more than half your waking day. Um, well, not maybe not way more, but definitely. Actually, yeah, it is more. I mean, just working nine to five is half your waking day if you're sleeping eight hours. And I think, in my opinion, that's like you. That's not good. I think society has got to a point where, you know, it's really fixed on working. Exactly what you said. I think people really link their identity to work, which is maybe why people work as much as they do. Um, 
and that, um, and that's not me saying, hey, you just need to lay down in bed and do nothing. Mm. I just think people need to express themselves, in my opinion, at least. And this is true for me, right? I don't know about the rest of the world, um, but this is I, I'm the best gauge I have for everyone else, to understanding everyone else. I think, you know, I really take a lot of joy in writing and reading and meeting friends and maybe... I don't know, if painting if I wanted to. I think people need to express themselves more creatively in different creative avenues, uh, which is very difficult to do if you're spending more than half your waking hours at in an office. And if you're working in something you're passionate about, more power to you. Like, excellent, awesome. I just think that most people aren't. And that just makes you think how many people, because they're not, are struggling even more well, but it's at the same time, it's a good thing. It's a positive thing because then it can be revealed to us. Are yes. we really doing what we want? I think about, I've never been more of a nutcase about my time than now. Like, I look at my time as like my life now. And I'm like, <laughs> I just traded. Like, if I, I do mundane, t- you got to eat shit sandwiches sometimes, right? You got to do shit that you don't want to do sometimes, especially when you grow on businesses and you got you want to get to X and Y position. You got to do shit you don't yeah. want to do. So there'll be moments throughout the months and the years you got to do that. And but now I'm at a point I'm thinking, mm, I'm never been more more critical of the my decision making towards my time. And it's like, yeah. Is working with this person, is doing this thing, is speaking to this person. I'm going to trade a sliver of my life. It's not time, it's life. And it really gets me sometimes because I'm like, mm-hmm. whoo, you don't get right. that back. No, no, you don't. No, <sighs> it's, uh, you know, it's really interesting you, you, you bring that up because now that uh, I did start, you know, filling up my Google Calendar. I know we were talking about Google Calendars yesterday. I use, I, I, I can't live without it. Uh, even though I know I was talking about how for months I was, I was cruising and not working as hard as I normally do. Um, I still use Google Calendar every day. I schedule in, you know, when I write, when I read, when I, I even started schedule, scheduling in, recently scheduling in when I shower. Uh, Same. Eat. Because, yeah. Sleep. Uh, no, eat. Eat, sleep, yes. I haven't scheduled in when I eat yet, um, but I, 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 it is a problem. Every, I know I'm scheduling things past dinner, every like through dinner every time, and every time I know I'm going to need to adjust it a little bit. But um, and, and so it's really interesting you bring that up because right now, you know, this is the first time in my life that I felt okay. Wow, there are really only 24 hours in a day, huh? Wouldn't you know? Like it's really we're we're playing with hours here. And even like half hours trying to move things around, fit everything into the week and, and all that. But uh, I think a really good example, yesterday I met up with a couple of friends. And um, maybe we can talk about COVID here in the Netherlands as well if you're interested. Yeah. But um, I remember, um, so I we agreed to meet at 8. Um, but so I was there at like 8. And they thought it was nine because I talked to one person and he talked to a couple other people and he told them nine. And so I was waiting there at the bar. I called them and then they started rushing over. But I was waiting at the bar for like a good 45 minutes just by myself, which normally I, I know that the me like two years ago would have flipped. I was like, dude, wasting like just flat out 45 minutes of my life. Um, but I was fine. And I, I was trying to understand why. Uh, I was actually writing about it yesterday. I didn't. I didn't know why I was so okay. Um, because and my th- my working hypothesis is that I've managed to kind of always have like these small things that I need to do anyways uh, that I can do through my phone. Uh, so whether that be you know go th- go through my writings, uh, think about this, think about that, that I can just fit in whenever I have an opening. Um, yeah. So it was really interesting, but I I, I don't know. Do you find that that your kind of, uh, I guess you could call it, uh, the seriousness with which you take your time uh, affects your relationships with people? <laughs> it did. Uh, and I think it's supposed to. Uh, now I've managed to find a really nice cadence 
right? Mm. But absolutely, you know, in, in, in my relationship with friends and my romantic relationship where early on I wasn't seeing my, my significant other consistently because I was... Mm, I was very obsessed with my preoccupations and my the things I was working on, and I di- and that was more of a priority above everything else. And mm. so, how I treated my time and my the things I did went above seeing other people because the mission is number one in my head. That's how I have approached my life. The the mission I got to complete the mission, right? When I complete the mission, I go f- I go complete another mission, right? Okay, okay. So the mission... Okay, I was going to ask what the mission is, but it's more of like a general... Yeah, it's more like a metaphor. A like, there's a lot of missions, right? They're, they're, mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. but now... You said... You asked, like, is time getting... Is the way I... The seriousness to which I approach time getting in the way of my relationships? Um, oh. It makes things clearer. It's like I'm very clear on who I want to spend my life with and who yeah. I want to speak to. Because I have, I've realized my standards and values. Like, are they aligned with that? Do I want to share that with this person or that opportunity? Um, yeah. Yeah, because I guess, I guess, you, you know, now I, it's probably, at least to you, incredibly clear what, what you're giving up to, you know, grab dinner with this person. You know, it's like I don't oh, even want to think the- about like a give up or a sacrifice. I've I've had a like a friend and mentor, um, Jay Ellis, who I've had on the podcast. He's like, mm. you're not sacrificing, you're investing. You need to change the framework to which you think about it. It's like I think we spoke about this maybe, but yes, I think we did on a bus somewhere, go, going somewhere. Um, I'm investing my time into this or that. I'm not sacrificing, and and I. I I used to always be like, oh, I'm, I'm giving something up. But right. no, I don't have to think about it like a scarcity thing. I can think about it like you're receiving something. Like I'm this time right here we're sharing together, every time I speak to somebody, we are receiving and giving each other the conversation. Sure. And so I'm not thinking, yeah. oh, I could be doing this or that because I want to be doing this. So I think it's a redirection of like, are you doing what you want to really do? Are you? The majority of the time, yes. But I pause on that because it's like, ah, the shit still like, that will come up that I got to do that I don't really want to do, but I got to do it. Like an obligation. Okay. okay. So, oh, I see. You gotta- Is it also more like, you know, with every business, you've got like, you've got the part that you love that you really enjoy doing you know i'd imagine that for you it might be like working with your clients and you know doing whatever it is reps are um <laughs> i love that that's that's the suit yeah. that, that's what a coach is those reps and clients that's the whole thing. um it's all good no but like you know interacting with people yeah and um and but uh you know you'd probably also have all the admin stuff and all the behind the scenes is that what you're referring to when when you're talking about the things that you know come up that you have to do yeah, that that's that's probably a, a good. That's that's where I. Yeah, that's where I begin to automate things, right? It's like, well, you're doing things one way, and they could be done more efficiently. So you know, going from people manually transferring you to being like, all right, now everything's on a direct debit system. How can I make things more efficient for myself? Well, I don't have to put my hand in this action, but I can let something run in the background. Um, like creating templates where I can plug and play. Like you have this problem, this template is appropriate for this. And I might tweak it slightly, but that saves now hours. And it's like you build automated systems that run in the background that, you know, it's like if you have to do a task more than a handful of times, it could probably be, hmm, maybe I'm misquoting that. If you have to do a task repeatedly over and over again, think about how it can be automated right you know people or it could be outsourced for example whether we're thinking about meals i you know i'm very diligent about what i put inside my body so i have to prepare meals okay it's not just random okay so 
I have to prep certain meals. I got my coach. He has he you know, tells me what to eat, how much to eat based on my goals. And so, okay, how can I automate? The, well, I've I've outsourced the decision making of what I'm going to eat, of how much I'm going to eat, and figuring out all the physiological uh, components and calculations towards what I need to do to reach my goals. We communicate, Mm -hmm. he sets a plan, I execute. So now I save myself a whole bunch of time and mental energy and I can get an objective third party who's much more experienced than me to help me. Right. What if, what, you know, how many hours we spend cooking food? If you have, if you're within financial means, could you save X hours a week, put that somewhere else and just get a meal delivery service? If you're mm. LeBron James, you're getting a chef. Why can't we right. think like this with everything we do so then we're only doing things that we really, really, really want to do? Mm. I mean, you raise an excellent point. So you're saying like go full, like 100% Tim Ferriss for our work week mode. <laughs> that's interesting. I guess, I guess that's <laughs> along those lines, isn't it? Yeah, right? Like automation taking templates you can just apply and outsourcing uh, everything you don't really want to do. I mean, I think, I think, um, I think, you know, you can't really argue with that. Yes, definitely. Like if you can, why don't you outsource what you don't like? Uh, I think the, the thing is why I would imagine most people wouldn't. And I mean, so what I was about to say is that it takes a lot of effort and energy in just kind of, understanding and taking account of what you actually don't like. Uh, I, I'm, I I live under the impression that a lot of people in the world just kind of live through life without a really, not, I'm sure there are a bunch of people who aren't what I'm about to say, but I think there are also a handful that, you know, feel really good or feel really bad, but aren't aware that they're feeling really good or feeling really bad. They might wake up in the morning feeling absolutely horrible and just kind of carry through the day, not noticing that they feel absolutely horrible. Yes. Um, and so to change that, you first first thing you have to do is take account of that. And I think that's very difficult for a lot of people to do. And you know, and so as I'm saying this, you know, I'd like to think that I'm someone who pays attention to how I feel and and th- what I think about, but I still don't outsource it. Well, I mean, actually, I do. Most of the things I do, I enjoy, but there are still definitely some things I haven't outsourced. Well, let's say um, money's not an issue. What what would mm. you outsource? Let's say I'm giving you 200 grand a year. What are you outsourcing? What are you automating? One hundred percent food, okay. grocery shopping, cooking. Um, Got it. Uh, which yeah, which I think an excellent out outsourcing of that if you don't have money is to just fast. Um, yeah, for sure, and it has so many health benefits. Yeah, as well, definitely. Uh, definitely food. Um, um, using public transport, I think I could get places a lot faster if I had just my own chauffeur. Yeah, driver. Uh, yeah, for sure. I thought about yeah. that. I did the calculations uh, one time of like, would it be cheaper to Uber everywhere I wanted to go, or mm. I'll, I'll pay for I'll drive my own car, I'll pay for fuel and expenses? And actually, Uber was more expensive by a measurable amount. Right. For me. But for example, in Singapore, if you're with someone else taking cabs and you split that cost with someone, mm. you're you're good to go. Yeah. Because it's like incredibly cheap, yeah. especially if you cut the cost. Uh, but definitely food, uh, getting places. Transport, yeah. And uh, yeah, and all the admin stuff of um, uh, my tutoring. So all, like messaging the parents, scheduling the lessons, um, keep like staying in touch, updating everyone. If I had someone who, because that's, that's the one thing I don't log. Uh, in my in my calendar because that's usually a couple minutes here or a couple minutes yeah. there, but I'm starting to suspect that it's taking at least two two to four hours a week, uh, which is, you know, I think it's very easy to actually have. That's probably one of the easiest things to outsource, or maybe the food is as well. But yeah, those are great examples. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, but yeah, with food, actually, uh, I thought about it when when you were talking about it. Um, because I know both you and I fast. I don't know. What was the longest fast you, you did? I did it in Singapore. We talked about this. When I told you, you asked me this question. I said, I think I said 24 or 36. Then okay. shortly after our time, I was experiencing some 
some pretty frustrating health ailments, which you're familiar with because I sent you that. Mm. Um, and then I, I think I did one or two 48s, right? And okay. I, th- I believe you were around the similar when you... Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the longest I'd done at that point was 48. Right. Yeah. Uh, because, well, you intermittent fast. Not at the moment. Consistently, right? Not at the moment. No. But you did in Singapore, if I'm not mistaken, or no? Uh, no, so, I usually cook my meals in the morning in okay. our, nice. our piss-poor kitchens. You did. <laughs> but go ahead. Didn't you do uh, like every Sunday or something Correct. like that? Correct. Great memory. Yeah. Every Sunday, 24 yeah. hours. I just gave my mind and gut a break yeah, yeah. and helped, you know, break down and catabolize some, some, some adipose tissue, some fat. And uh, just let, because I would eat a lot during the week because, you know, I was trying to put on muscle mass and I did that. And um, feast and famine is a principle that I really, really believe in philosophically and scientifically. Mm. Mm. No, I uh, so I, I definitely started taking fasting a lot more seriously after Singapore, actually. Mm. Uh, more, more of just uh, like uh, definitely for the health benefits as well. But for me, that was like a nice add-on. Uh, for me, the main reason was like uh, it was a very interesting experiment, and I've noticed that I do that a lot. Uh, you know, maybe you could hear from the way I speak about I spoke about COVID. You know, for me, it's just like an incredible experiment we're just changing one or multiple variables and seeing how you change and how you behave and how you act in that situation uh so i really like to think of a lot of my experiences as like data points and uh, okay so like given these variables i reacted this way and that's and then once you collect enough you can start to understand how you behave um and so for me i wanted to do that with fasting as well so i came back and i did a three then a five day fast uh about uh, two weeks apart, maybe three weeks just apart. Pure water. Yeah, just a water fast. Got exactly. Um, and by far, the first thing I noticed was how much time I saved not having to go buy food yep. and not having to go cook food. Yep. I didn't realize how much time that took up uh, in the day. It's big. It's incredible. Yeah, yeah. So not only are you throwing away time, you're also gaining calories. And so some people if, they if don't need more of that. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Because, you know, as as I promptly found out after Singapore, it's not always bulking season. <laughs> <laughs> oh, people don't know. Oh, I think I got it here. To- oh, I got it here. Perfect. Tom, mm. so we're in uh, we're in Five Guys <laughs> in Hong Kong, right? Fucking, you know what? Five Guys is coming to Sydney, motherfucker. Woo! Let's go. I can see you taking that flight just for Five Guys. Oh, it's done. <laughs> oh, it's, it's already done. I got no, no. I got. I got uh, already got uh, tickets to the Hamilton show that's coming to Sydney next year. Okay, mm. and it's in Sydney, so you already know what's going down. The five guys before, and then the the show, and then maybe right. maybe once again. I don't know. You get crazy. That's what I think. Yeah, Hamilton's a long show, so. Uh... Have you seen? The, have you seen on that on uh, on Disney? Have you seen it? I have not. I have not. It's really good. It's. I was so yeah. like as a fan, a big fan of hip hop and rap. It's as well. They did such an incredible, uh, incredible job at delivering a. I'm not. I'm not a guy who's like typically historically into plays or like, um, you know, sing songy type performances, uh, but. You know, in my experiences of going to a couple over the years, it's a very powerful performance. It's very, it's actually quite enjoyable beyond my stereotypes that I applied to them. But they did such a good job of making you feel like it was there. And I really, really recommend it to everybody who enjoys creative expressions of art and acting and music combined in, in, in history as well. Because they're, they're talking about the Family Fathers of America. And I know your connection to America, obviously... Right. with you being born there very true so please use uh alexander's referral link uh disneyplus.com slash uh talking chips that's right me and disney <laughs> to come. And to come me and disney are talking uh, no but that's uh it's cool that you felt that way even watching it on your tv or a computer um because in my experience um uh, watching so i i historically do really have really enjoyed musicals um and 
I really, really like to go. It, well, I went to London just just before COVID hit, uh, and I went to watch um, Wicked, and that was incredible. I yeah, same. Yeah. Um, but in my experience, watching it on a computer or like any musical on a computer hasn't been, it hasn't had that same gravitas of like it won't though uh, like yeah yeah like it did it but i'm glad i'm glad you're going to to watch it in uh in sydney live yes yeah, yeah. um yeah. i hope i just hope that we can, everything's okay by then and you know governments our government doesn't uh you know restrict us again yeah um by early next year middle of next year we'll see yeah, yeah. I mean, the rest of Australia is fine, right? As far as I know, it's only Victoria that's uh, shut down. I'll we'll get into that in a second, we'll but there. let me we'll just show you what Tom sent. So this is <laughs> for those who aren't uh, watching on YouTube or Facebook. This is what we got. We got he made stickers of me in front of a Five Guys burger, staring it down. Uh, yeah, and with is- with a cup full of fries to the left. And a frothy milkshake on the right. Did I have that milkshake? Or was that you yours? Got it off. Uh, that may have been mine. Actually, I believe it was. Uh, you, I'm, you're more yeah. of a shake guy. But bro, have you ever yeah, tasted yeah. some better tasting burgers and fries yeah. on the planet? I'm not sure. It's I'm... really good. It's really really good. And so yeah, so it's always welcome season. Oh yeah, yeah I and the text. That's what it says. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. There's, it's a thicker. It's not just Alexander with a burger and some milkshakes. Uh, <laughs> although I, I'll send you that picture, uh, those stickers later. Um, <laughs> it, so, <laughs> so it says it's always welcome season. That was kind of like a running joke in uh, in Singapore. Yeah, that's right. Mm. That was a that was a crazy trip. Um, yeah. But the trip here in Melbourne is very restricted, and I, I hope. Uh, I hope we can get out of it without too much collateral damage to people's lives, businesses. Yeah. It's very concerning. Okay, tell me, because here's the thing that I realized when we did, a, for those who don't know, which is everybody, we, we did a group call, you know, with everybody from Singapore, okay? And yeah. what I quickly realized was that, hold on, everybody's experience of this pandemic is not just different, but it's like on a large spectrum of different from yep. wildly yep. different, like it could be wildly different. I'm like, oh, we're not all going to take the same lessons from this. Mm-hmm. Like even That's a great point, actually. But even people in d- different states in my same country aren't going to take the same. Melbourne is taking one of the hardest lessons, yep. I would say top 10 in the world. I'm going to give respect to Italy and New York who saw catastrophic you know, deaths and um, hospital overwhelm. But from a pure, you can look outside and everything's fine type business to restrictions, aka the case and case fatality ratio versus the severity of restrictions is some of the most severe in the world. So tell me, Tomor Porat, Mm-hmm. What uh, what's the situation in Amsterdam? Uh, it's nothing like that, <laughs> especially after that description. Um, so the situation in Amsterdam is actually, uh, and we'll talk. I think this is uh very on point, like a great time to talk about it. So, as you know, I was on vacation, and uh, coming back, we'll talk about that that whole experience. Uh, but coming back, I had a little bit of a culture shock with regard to how COVID is handled uh, in Cyprus, which is where I was at, uh, to the Netherlands. Um, because in Cyprus, I don't know if they changed the regulation since, but you got to wear a mask at every closed indoor place. Uh, so if you're going to a supermarket, if you're going to a museum, whatever it is, as long as you're not eating there. So... For example, a restaurant, you need to wear a mask. Um, I assume public transport as well, although we didn't take any. Um, You know, all the waiters and waitresses, masks, um, hand sanitizers everywhere. So I come back to Amsterdam, and uh, 
uh, yeah, so as you know, I, I had to get an, a quick x-ray, no big deal. But I came into the hospital wearing a mask because I, like, I was just so used to walking into a closed space, putting on a mask. No one's wearing a mask. Mm -hmm. Not the people who work there, not the nurses, the doctors, the, the, the visitors, nothing. Um, there are, they do try to keep distance, uh, but that's about it. Uh, and we've got the little plastic uh, visors uh, behind registration desks and stuff yeah, like that. Okay. Um, but other than that... Uh, when was this? Like, when did uh, you go in? That was two weeks ago. Okay, and let's call it... So we're in 15th September now, two weeks ago. Yeah, uh, so first. Now, here's the thing. Netherlands... And Netherlands is the country, Amsterdam is the city, so ne necessarily the cases in the Netherlands aren't representative of what's happening in Amsterdam, right? So that's true. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so you took I it th off. Uh, I imagine you took it off. You took the mask off. Uh, yeah, I did. I did, but only afterwards because uh, I was with my mom, and she said that they probably think I have it. I have um, COVID if I have the mask on. Interesting. And so she, did. yeah. Um, and so I was like, fair point. And maybe that's why other people are not wearing it. I don't know. But uh, it's definitely a much more lax uh, take on the whole uh, COVID situation than I think the rest of the world, especially in the States and in Victoria uh, and India now also. Oh, been, India, uh, Brazil, getting Russia. Yeah. They are some of the most severely hit. In fact, the yeah. Brazil president, I read, denied it for a long period of time. He downplayed it mm. and didn't put in restrictions. We'll be fine. You know, we'll keep things going. And now, oh, they're in Foxville. So <laughs> that's not a good place to be. But to give context, when you went into the hospital, no one was wearing masks. The Netherlands was experiencing about four, five, six hundred cases a day. Right? Okay. And also for the listeners, we've got about 16, 17 million people in the country. If you want that as like a that's ratio helpful. to your country. Okay, that's yeah. helpful because Australia's got about 26 million. Victoria's got about something yeah. like five, four, five million. Um, mm -hmm. Now for context on the difference, we have put in, our, our state government has put in some of the most severe restrictions that I've seen in the world on the basis of those that what we just what I just described in Amsterdam what happened two weeks ago we were getting five six we topped out about 700 cases and then everybody was like they're getting they're getting scared aka the uh, the leaders the premier of our state talking about if things get worse we will put in tighter restrictions and what that turned into is as you heard on the call um, a curfew Right. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Eight p.m. to five a.m. You cannot be outside unless mm -hmm. it's an emergency. You know, it's got you go. You need have an exemption. Masks mandatory. They've been mandatory for, gee, it feels like two months now. Something like. Just walking outside, right? Like just I could be street. by myself without another human in sight for a hundred, two hundred meters, and we have to wear a mask. You can see my attitude towards this yeah. is, uh, well, the observing the rules aren't always aligned with the science um, that I've seen, that I observe, or even common sense, um, and so that can be frustrating. But it's just interesting because you look at one country and they have similar cases to you, and you can see like a flip of responses. What do you make of that? Yeah. And I mean, uh, you, uh, oh, actually, oh, sorry. You said Victoria had about five, six million people. I'm going to give you the exact. Okay. I mean, yeah, because as a ratio, that's more than the Netherlands. Um, but yeah, it's, I, if you would scale the level of restrictions we're placing on, the government's placing on us here to the ratio yeah. that you have it wouldn't it's not a linear it's like a very exponential scale right but i see what you're um, trying to say you try yeah that's important yeah. to give relative relativity yeah in this. yeah yeah definitely 
Uh, but yeah, that's, you know, and that, that I think is a, cause you know, I think both you and I are very adamant believers in, uh, you know, there is a lot to learn and gain from painful and difficult situations. Absolutely. Uh, and, uh, one thing, so now, so to fill in the audience, I've got a cast on my right foot for the uh, YouTube audience. Oh, yep, here it is. There it is. Um, it's all good. Um, it's just a small fracture, uh, but it's in a, it's in a part that the doctor said is uh, important for the stability of the foot, and so they wanted to put a cast on. Uh, and so the first couple, uh, I've, I've had it for two weeks, so those two weeks have been great. It's been a very, very interesting experience uh, being with a cast, getting around places with crutches, you know, getting looks on the street. Uh, it was really, really interesting to see how people crippled or handicapped people are kind of treated in society. It was even better when I was in Cyprus uh, and I flew back home. They gave me a wheelchair at the airport. Uh, Did you ask for one? I asked, for, well, I asked for crutches and they said, we can't do that, but we can give you a wheelchair. Um, so I was like, sounds Maybe good. Maybe crutches be like a weapon. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It, you, like you could just whack them out. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and so you can definitely, uh, so that was a very interesting experience for me to learn and see how, how, you know, you're treated when you're in a wheelchair or with crutches. Uh, but now it's gotten to the point where I feel like, oh, okay, I've gained everything I've gotten, I could have gotten from this. We can take the cast off now. You know what I mean? And so I feel like the same thing with COVID, like, yes, you learn and you adapt and, and you evolve your business and how you act and what you do due to the lockdown. But maybe now you've kind of, you've, you've, you've gotten everything you could have gotten out of it. You're fully saturated. And now you're like, okay, cool. We got it guys. Yeah. Let's move on. Yeah. We end. Uh, yeah. I feel like that's kind of where, where you guys are with COVID from a, I think a mental perspective, a, a lot of people are getting there and are there. Um, but unfortunately it's like, it's obviously not as simple as like, we learn a lesson about ourselves and you know, we challenge ourselves through this involuntary pain and suffering. But it's like, at the end of the day, this is a systemic problem. It's not idiosyncratic, meaning idiosyncratic, I crash a car, it just affects me and the person or thing I crash into. It's it's a small, tight-knit um, yep. uh, res- uh, variables that are changed. Whereas this, obviously, you know where I'm going, systemic, it can affect a whole population from one person to be a super spreader to, to set a cascade of events that can lead to illness and death and chronic long-term effects. And that's the tricky thing because one person or one group of people, one group of bad actors, voluntary or involuntary bad actors, can create mayhem whether it be death or illness or, or, or anything in between. And that, that's what's really tricky about all this is that yeah. what do you do? What is the right decision? If you, if you, if I, Tom, you have a magic wand and you get to control your state, your city, your country, your the world around you. What do you do? Like, I don't, in terms of restriction, like I can't get rid of COVID. Like in terms of restrictions, yeah. what, I, what I would do. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that's a that's that's a really good question. Um, it's difficult to answer. Yeah. But it's almost uh, rhetorical. You know, too. For, yeah. But from what the perspective, like if I would imagine myself as you know uh, a person in parliament or you know someone who is actually in charge and can set the regulations uh, for a specific city or country um i think from their perspective you know it's very very difficult to um do anything but the extremes i think in yeah. general for us humans yeah uh it's very easy for us to either do zero or do one it, like to modulate that is very difficult um possible just requires a lot more energy than doing either extreme and so i can see why uh, some, you know, leaders of state decide to go full on, hundred percent. You guys are wearing masks everywhere, like zero tolerance, because that's just a lot easier to do than kind of oh, like taking it by case case by case basis. And like, oh, Alexander, no, uh, let's test you. Let's see, are you a super spreader? No, okay, cool. You can walk without a mask in these areas. That's just a, very difficult to do. Um, 
So, like, I, I get I get where they're coming from. It's like you give people an inch and they take a mile. Is that, is that what we're working with? Um, no, what do you mean by that? So, like, I see it as a situation. It's like we have to be so overbearing and restrictive and overcautious because if I tell you not to do that, if I tell you to get to bed at 8 p.m., to be in your home at 8 p.m., your adherence to X restriction or X law and rule is not going to be 100%. If I do a diet plan for you, Tom, I write you a nutrition plan, uh, and I say, Tom, I want I want 99% adherence. Do the best you can. I want 99% adherence in order to get X goal. You're a human right. being. You're not going to get 99% most likely, okay? Right. But you're going to get 95 or 90 now, if I said, hey, Tom, I want 80% adherence, it's okay if you don't, you know, do every single thing, right? You're going to then hit 70 or 65, and suddenly the range of outcome or the, the, the impact towards the outcome you can have is way lower. And so if you put that for these situations, it's like if the government was looser, I think people would take more and be more lax. So I understand mm -hmm. the human behavior aspect of if we're super strict, we're going to do a better job at eradicating this issue. Gotcha. No, I completely agree. Except with you, you give me too much credit. At most, 50%. <laughs> That's why I need to say 99%. Right? <laughs> yeah, no, no. I, uh, I, uh, I, 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 I definitely agree with what you're saying. I think, uh, I mean, even with the restrictions, I don't know how it is there. Just the, uh, just yesterday, I saw a picture of a girl I, I went to university with, and uh, it was like, um, uh, was so much fun at what name of whatever festival, uh, hashtag fuck COVID or something like that. Hmm? Um, festival. So yeah, yeah, she went to like a rave or something. I forget exactly what it was. Uh, and so it's like, it, there were like two pictures of her just like at a rave. Um, probably uh, recently. So even so, I'm saying even with the restrictions and all that, people still do that. So correct. Without it would probably be even worse. Correct. So that that's where I see the human behavior yeah. coming into it. And then that you watch that. Um, well, actually, to go more on that, that's the thing. People are going to learn different things from this all across the world. And so my seriousness towards the lessons I'm learning and we're learning here in this state be way different to to you like i saw you yeah. when we did the call you're sitting at a cafe with no masks <laughs> you fucks you <laughs> bastards how dare you right We're but it's friends. it's awesome that you can do that yeah. right it's like oh, yeah can't do that and, and so to give you an uh some context like that would be so that was that was in cyprus and that was the the restriction right like that was the restricted world in cyprus just to give you the an idea of how lax it is in amsterdam like here you go to a closed cafe in a closed place or a closed supermarket whatever you want to call it nothing really nothing. you guys can sit nothing. at restaurants you're fine yeah can you go to movies yes what yeah. So gyms, fine. Uh, and so gyms. That's I don't know gyms. Well, actually, yeah, that's I, I don't know about gyms. But uh, movies. I know that they, uh, when you try to book a ticket, they'll automatically place you uh, two like they put two empty seats to your left and right. I love that. And get away from yeah. me. I want space. Let me spread. <laughs> right. That should be right? mandatory. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and also the seat in front and behind you they automatically oh, uh, would make empty. Beautiful. Them. I put my feet and, up. Yeah. I don't have someone breathing behind me. Right? Exactly. No one's sitting in front of you, so you can't see. I mean, they're not making as much money, but, you know, I can enjoy yeah, but whatever. I think, I think they were making zero when uh, when they had full lockdowns. And I think people are still wary of going to the movies, just kind of internally. Yeah. Uh, so just making something I think they're happy with. Uh, but yeah, so we were on the call. Yeah, this is where it all started, right? Because you were talking, that's a very interesting observation realizing that people are going to get incredibly different lessons 
from COVID, which is, I actually didn't think about that, uh, depending on the level of restriction that they're living in. What was crazy to me is when, uh, you know, our American friends were talking to us about how they don't let you in if you're wearing a mask. They force you to take it off. Who said that? that? Yes, um, I've heard that before, though. Uh, was, was, yeah, that that, was that Wisconsin? Was, Nora? Yeah, I think so. Or Taylor, I forget. Both are in Wisconsin. May might have been Marissa, but I don't know. Yeah, maybe. maybe. Either way, uh, crazy. That that was crazy to me. Um, forcing you to take it off to come inside. Yeah, it's really an interesting observation in some Americans' um, ability to freely express and do what they want. It's like if there's one thing that's made more clear to me in this time, it's that Americans appear to pride themselves on their freedom of speech and freedom of protest and to do what they want right to be able to have the freedom to decide Mm -hmm. and it's just not the same in a lot of other countries like here like if we had our premier like i heard um one of the mayors or governors in america who had very questionable laws and rules he was putting in he had people Protesters were throwing flammable retardants and, and explosive, not explosive, flammable objects and objects in general into the lobby of the hotel building or, or apartment building he was living in, in protest, in trying to incite violence and fear and, and you know, along those lines. Because of the restrictions? Because of the things he had been putting in place. I see. Okay. If they flip out of what they're seeing here, if... And it just makes me think because we are so much more tolerant as a society, as a state, as people in Australia. I'm not saying one's better or worse. I'm just saying different. If we had, if our premier was a governor in some American city and state and did the same things he did in the, these other states, there would be fucking mayhem. I really believe that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there was for for like a good couple of weeks, right? Like. Oh no, but that was because of the uh, of the protests for uh, Black Lives Matter. Uh, uh, sometimes at some places, because I remember, yeah. But I was confusing that with COVID, but it was overlapping. So yeah, it was overlapping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, but speaking of, you mentioned uh, you know people uh, spreading COVID, you know whether intentionally or unintentionally, um, and I was thinking, you know, at what point. Are they, is someone who, you know, doesn't adhere to the restrictions and kind of just does whatever they want? Like take take the girl I studied with, for example, right? Going to that rave. Um, I would imagine that she never had the intention of killing someone by giving them COVID or anything of that sort or even hurting anyone. Uh, yet she may have spread COVID to, to that person or to a person. Uh, at what point is someone who, you know, does that unintentionally responsible for what they did? I think that's a very interesting question for myself, at least. Do you right, because answer? they didn't mean to. I mean, it's tough because, you know... Are they actively I think, I think, breaking a rule or law? Uh, I mean, technically, yeah. I'm pretty sure raves are not... In like right public now. gatherings of uh, a certain amount? Like if you're actively yeah. engaging in a public gathering whether you it's a question of it's like oh but maybe is the law, rule of law and it's like a personal judgment it's like is that rule or law does it make sense should it be put in place do you disagree with it okay maybe you disagree with it but it doesn't abstain you from taking responsibility for your actions like if I manslaughter if I don't if I crash my car and, and kill somebody accidentally manslaughter I'm still yeah. responsible I didn't. My intentions right. weren't to harm, but I'm still responsible. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's a good point. It's the only thing with uh, with COVID is it, uh, yeah. I guess it's it's pretty much the same example. It's just a lot more difficult to say, hey, you gave this person COVID. Exactly. Uh, because where do you to go? Like blanket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's because I was thinking, you know. I guess it would depend on whether they they are aware of what they're doing or not, right? Because like if you were, 
I don't know, if you were like 14 and you had no idea. And I guess that's why they don't have as, uh, you know, strict sentences for juveniles. But, and you had no idea what the repercussions of what you were doing were, and you got into that car accident. Yes, I guess, yeah, you would still be responsible from a, a law perspective, uh, you know, in court. But I guess you wouldn't get as high as strict of a punishment yeah. because they would assume that you weren't aware of what you were doing. And so I was thinking with that girl as well, maybe she just isn't aware. And then how, you know, I, I feel like you can't blame her as much as you would be able to if she was aware yeah. of her actions. For sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you're, we're trying to measure knowledge and ignorance or let us, uh, the range of ignorance or knowledge. And we're trying to measure intent. Like, were they yes. willfully doing something with maybe not the intent to harm somebody, but the intent to not care whether you harm somebody, I think, can be equally as dangerous. 100%. I think that's a very, that's something that's often looked over, I think. So I think, in, in my experience at least, um, I really enjoy, you know, and we've talked about this as well, right? Just, like, sitting down and talking to people and just, like, kind of dissecting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so from what I've seen and also from my own personal experiences, there's almost never an intent to hurt or do damage. Uh, but what you see a lot more often is maybe, maybe you can't call it an intent to overlook, but it's more that when you get caught in like a, a sticky situation, uh, in, you know, think, think not, nothing physical, more relationships doesn't have to be romantic just like friends family romantic whatever like some sort of social relationship uh it's almost always in my experience uh the person who harmed the other almost never tried to do it intentionally it was almost always a oh i uh, you got caught in the crossfire of this person just trying to do something or trying to live their life does that make sense yeah do you have an example of that, like, yeah, uh, is like I think a- I think cheating is an excellent example. So think of all the people who were cheated on. Um, so you're going out with someone for you know an X number of years or months or whatever you want it to be, right? Let's just call it like a year and a half, and then uh, your girlfriend cheats on you with some other guy. Naturally, and I think most people probably experience this. They feel horrible. They might be angry at their girlfriend, or well, probably ex girlfriend now. Uh, they might feel devastated. They'll think, you know, what did I do wrong? What was I lacking? Um, what did I not provide to the relationship? You know, all these negative thoughts. Where in reality, I would argue, and of course this changes on a case-to-case basis, but most probably the girl didn't want to inflict damage on you. And sometimes a cheating partner would want to do that, right? And I'm using a girl as an example because we're both heterosexual guys, but, you know, you can... Guys cheat as well for all the audience at home. Don't come at me. Um, But um, they almost never have the intention to actually hurt. And I think the people who do want to intentionally hurt, those are usually, um, you know, results of uh, long-term games. So, for example, marriage. And you can build up a lot of resentment in marriage Mm. and want to hurt the other person but that usually usually in you know younger relationships uh the intent to hurt is not there it's usually just i want to experience x or you know i felt like i've dated you for five years and i missed my my early 20s where i could just party and hook up with any person i wanted to i felt like i missed that and i really wanted to experience that nowhere in there are you included right it wasn't like i wanted to hurt you and I think people don't realize that a lot of the time. And I think that's a very interesting um, framing of a negative situation. That yeah. the intent to hurt is often not there. It is, I'm sure, at times. But I think more often than not, we assume that an offense was a personal offense. When in reality, we were just walking and some guy was trying to shoot another person and it hit us in the shoulder. And we're like, holy shit, why the fuck did you shoot me? Like, what are you doing? And you you fail to realize that, oh, they were really trying to shoot that person. If anything, I think they could be blamed for carelessly shooting. 
and not making sure that there was no one else around. But I think a, a lot of people get blamed for uh, intent when really there wasn't one. Interesting. It's just something I've been thinking about. Yeah. Yeah. Do we do we improperly ascribe intent when there was none to begin with? It was just a shitty outcome, right? It's like, but the, here's yeah. the thing. The person on the other end gets hurt most of the time equally, regardless. Mm. You know, it seems like, like, I think it'll sting obviously a little bit more if someone has the intent to cause you pain, if you oh, know 100%. that. Yeah, but get out. Well, the outcome of pain and suffering is is very visceral and very present when you do are on the other end of say for example someone cheating on you and um yeah that person though is still liable for their actions or they'll feel the responsibility of those actions aj person splitting up with them the, the person you know cutting ties with them. yeah for sure and you know the there will be consequences i'm sure whichever consequences there will be uh but what i think is very interesting is that first of all us as human beings naturally ascribing naturally assuming and it makes sense right because we're all egocentric and so it, it makes sense that when something bad happens yeah. oh it must have happened because they wanted to hurt me yes right because and i get that but uh and this, what I'm getting into now, is something we briefly talked about uh, one time in the downstairs part of North Spine. I don't know if you remember, but it is the kind of, even if the person who was cheated on, and I, I was never cheated on, so I guess I don't really have that, well, in like the, in the classical official sense of the word, uh, like that firsthand experience, but I would imagine that even the person that was cheated on uh, if they would realize that, hey, you know, this, she never meant to hurt me, you know, and we've, we've talked and it's clear that she never meant to hurt me. She didn't want to hurt me yet. I'm still really hurt. And so you can rationally understand and you might be hurt for, you know, if this was a very serious relationship, this might be like long-term damage might take you like a year to get out of it. Maybe six months. I don't know. Even though you rationally and logically understand that there wasn't any ill intent to begin with. And I think that's very interesting that even though there's logic, our brains, and I guess some people would call that the emotional part of you kind of overpower. And I think the fact that we can't override that, we can't override the hard wiring of our brains with our kind of software programming of logic uh, makes sense and I think is fascinating. It's a muscle. I think you gotta train it. I honestly don't know if you, like, I think you can to an extent. Okay, let's be specific. What are we talking about? Like, let's get super granular. What are we talking about that maybe couldn't be trained? What's that? The well, software so, and the hardware. Okay. Yeah, so basically, well, I call this phenomenon the logical mind you lost to the brain. And basically, what I would argue is that our brains, you know, their structure and the way they work has been shaped through, you know, thousands of years of evolution and you know that's why we're tribal that's why we need a community that's why we need to feel like we belong and we want to you know to have children and all that all of that i would argue is a result of evolution right and all the people who left the tribe because they were independent or whatever they died and we don't have their genes anymore right and so we have this brain that's almost archaic in the way it works uh here today with us and we also have like this modern logic yeah and i just think that the logic can never overpower the machine of the brain which has been you know being built up over you know thousands of years and that's why i don't think we can train it because in my opinion it's you know it's like asking google chrome to change the motherboard on your computer it can't, right? The motherboard on your computer, which is your brain in my example, it's there, it's the hardware, it's a, it's right there. 
And we can use Google Chrome to do certain things on using the hardware, but we can never use Google Chrome to change the hardware. And so, you know, the way I see it, it's, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think that's basically it. I, I, it's just that, like, I wanted, I wanted to elaborate a little bit more, but I didn't want, I, I was worried that it might confuse. Do you get what I'm saying? Does that make sense to you? Yes. Um, I think it reminds me of, it's like the, 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 the friction between modern thinking and a very old reptilian brain having just, you know, not being able to necessarily meld together effectively. But what I think is especially even more problemsome is our modern lifestyle and this very old millions of year old brain not being able to cope with social me- the, the, the ramifications of social media, the ramifications of pharmaceutical addictions, um, right. of environmental pollution, all the stresses we put in our body, nutritional uh, processed junk that we ingest, and the fact that we can get stuck here in this really crazy loop and cycle of not just emotions but also like we're changing the way our brain chemistry functions at like a a deep structural functional level where you know certain neurotransmitters and hormones and uh body systems are going to be hyperactive and hypoactive depending on the the modern lifestyle that we are living and i think that's very present in the development of young boys and children engaging with social media. I agree. I think that I think that's uh, a derivative. I think we're both kind of talking about the same thing. Okay. Because, uh, for example, like take social media for example. Maybe young, uh, young children might not be aware of you know the consequences of you know scrolling through Instagram and seeing what everyone else is doing for five hours a day, or I'm obviously exaggerating, but you know, maybe someone, if you're young, you might not be aware, but you know, take, take someone who's a little bit older, right? You know, I would say, you know, if you're 15 or older, you kind of have an idea of your actions and what being on Instagram means and all that. But I'm, I use Instagram cause that's obviously like a really prevalent form of social media for everyone. Uh, and you might understand that it's not good. For you you know maybe you feel really bad scrolling through it so uh instagram maybe you feel like you're wasting your time maybe you feel this maybe maybe you feel great and if you feel great good for you continue yeah, awesome. but i you know i think a lot of people feel bad and they understand that it's bad for them but they can't stop or they won't stop because the brain overpowers the logic it's you know mm. exactly it's like an addictive loop thing. i mean it's like just think it's like when how often and this is a rhetorical and for, for us, like how often when we get off social media, whatever platform it may be, do we feel better than we felt before we got on it? Right. Tell me. Let's be for real me, honest with ourselves. Yeah. Okay, do we count YouTube as a social media, as a form of social media? Though? It's a good question because I think YouTube yeah. is in a bit of its own unique space Yeah. with its ability to... Like, I feel usually better after going through that stuff. Me too. Yeah. So, you know, because I, I think you can learn and gain a lot from, yeah. you know, education, videos. podcasts. Or, yeah. 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 Uh, but yeah, almost never. Uh, I, uh, yeah, I don't use, I barely use Instagram anymore. I still have it on my phone uh, for if people message me, some like send pictures or whatever. But otherwise, I, I, I don't use Instagram anymore. I don't use Facebook anymore. Uh, and specifically, Facebook more just because it kind of faded out. But Instagram was like a very conscious, I'm stopping, I'm, I'm not going to use it anymore because I noticed that I wasn't feeling good after. What were after you using. noticing? I was, was just, it, yeah. Was it more well, subtle or was it, was it obvious? It was very subtle. Very, very subtle. Um, it was... I remember I stopped, again, it, I stopped using it once for two weeks, just as an experiment. This was a long time ago. I really wanted to see just people, there were talks of like, this was must have been like three years ago or something like that, of like, oh, Instagram being bad for you or whatever. I was like, let me stop. Let me stop it for two weeks, see what's up. I didn't notice anything immediately when I stopped. 
And when I got back to it, I didn't notice anything on the initial kind of getting back in. But over the course of a couple of weeks, I noticed, first of all, how much time it was taking on my day. But also, I suddenly was kind of carrying this. I, I can't really. I, it was all time ago, so I don't really remember exactly what it was. But I remember the broad stroke was not feeling good. Um, and it was, yeah, it was just kind of, yeah, it was, it was not a, a good feeling for me. I know that some people really enjoy it. Uh, and it's because I don't use it. I really like to talk to people who do use it and kind of see where they are with it. Because if they really enjoy it, that's really interesting. To but me. I and think a lot of really... people really enjoy it. Like they really enjoy, I suspect a lot of people really enjoy it. Like they really enjoy drugs and alcohol and sugary mm. s- satiating food. Like I, right. I, that's what I believe. Um, I think it's very dopaminergic, meaning it stimulates a lot of these neurotransmitters that give people temporary acute feelings of, um, like almost like a high and feeling good. And we get stuck in loops and cycles where we're trying to constantly chase these feelings. Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, and so what really caught me off guard, I was talking to a friend of mine about it recently. And I, he seemed to genuinely just have a very healthy relationship with Instagram. And That's that was the first time I did it. Yeah, you know, I was talking to him about like, you know, when he sees like his friends posting, whatever or you know whatever it is so first of all i think what was really interesting most of his instagram was not his friends it was you know uh people on youtube social media people uh and so it was i would say about 70 to 80 percent of the content he was consuming on instagram wasn't related to anyone in a circle uh so you know it might be like i don't know gary vivid videos or youtuber he likes following them on instagram or whatever it is and only 20% was, these are of course rough estimates, were uh, pictures of his friends. And when he said that when he like scrolls through pictures of his friends, he is really happy with it. I'm like, oh, good for S- Sandra that she's doing this. And like he feels like a genuine joy. Uh, that being said, he also uh, just mutes everyone, everyone's story, uh, unless it's really, really funny. Uh, so every so Monday, he doesn't he has, see Instagram stories because he's muted everything. It well, mo- so most of his close friends, not close friends. I'm sure his close friends are unmuted, but like most of the peripheral friends that he still follows on Instagram are muted. Uh, and it's, he has this system. Like every Monday, he acts access people. So he watches the stories naturally, and then uh, and then you know some bad stories get on his radar, and then he gives them a week to kind of prove themselves. <laughs> <laughs> and, if it's, and if it's not good by Monday, they're getting muted. Yeah, um, why not? And yeah, and so I, that, and that was the first time I saw someone who had a very healthy relationship, or perceivingly, perceive. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Yeah, it it seemed like he had a very healthy relationship with Instagram. Um, it's possible. I think yeah, it's possible, definitely possible. But you have to be very aware of what you're doing. Yes, and I think most people aren't. And that's the thing about coming back to liability are these platforms and businesses liable for the effects that they're having on a whole society do you know how many facebook users there are active facebook users it'll blow your tits off your face you don't know how many are take a guess oh that's that's no i shouldn't because what what if i guess like way too high um i'm gonna say I'll try to be realistic. Active Facebook users. Active. Not inactive. Not inactive. Maybe like half a billion. So 500 million. (laughs) Is that too much? I don't know. (laughs) Is that too much? All right. So (laughs) monthly active users. 2.6 billion. Yo. With a... Active? B. That... How do we count active? Yo. That is from May 2020, Alberto.com, 2.6 b- 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 billion. Damn. That's almost a third of the world. That's a lot of users. Even if that's 20, 30% off, let's, let's call the statistics a bit off. That's just sure. a, a bonkers amount. 1.73 billion users that are visiting the social networking site on a daily basis. Um, 
So just think about Instagram, then, because I would I would argue that right. Instagram is way more prevalent than uh, than Facebook. Good thing they bought them. June 2018, Instagram has reached the one billion monthly active user mark, but that is two years. That ago. was 2018. Yeah. Yeah. So. That's interesting. Instagram will reach 112 million users, US users, sorry, in 2020. Jeez, 100. Oh, okay. That's, yeah, like that's, a th- a, that's a third of the country. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Oh, oh. So look, obviously, is it real? Oh, not obviously, but is it realistic or even reasonable to allow on to get these companies to be liable for the direct and indirect consequences they have on people's mental health i don't know but there's a duty i think to regulate and to do your best you can to help people through those how you use your platform wow that's very interesting because that's really really interesting because okay so there you know in economics we say that uh if you have more options, you're better off. Always. So they say objectively, and it makes sense, right? Better you have off more in options, what way? Always, in any sense of any sense of the word, you're better off than what you had before you had more options, right? So if I, you know, can only, you know, eat chicken now, if I can eat chicken and pizza, I'm better off. I might not want to eat that pizza, but I'm better off because I have that option, right? Um. And you know, same with drugs, right? The fact that we have the ability to do cocaine from an economic perspective, we're better off than not having the option to do that. It's just up to us to decide whether we want to or not. And so we see that having these platforms, well, by that definition is better for us, I guess from a very logical and a very kind of numbers perspective, it's better for us than not having those platforms. And so you can't really blame any owner of that company for giving us the option, right? Because they're not forcing you to be on that platform. They're just putting it out there and they're saying, listen, you can come on it if you want to. And so it's just that we as people are very bad at modulating what's good and what's bad for us. Absolutely. And, And so are they to blame for that? You know, that's very interesting. Yeah, that uh, that you can't be held responsible for human. Well, okay, let me. See. Are they responsible for human nature? Like that's what it comes down to, right? It's like it yeah. is a choice. It's voluntary. Hmm. Yeah, no one's forcing you. You know, Mark Zuckerberg is not coming to your door, holding a holding a gun to your head and telling you to like to for two point six billion people to join Facebook. You know. Nice. Um, and so maybe, you know, and and this comes back exactly to what we were talking about before, you know, maybe the only thing they can be blamed for is if they can be blamed for anything at all is for continuing to, you know, make their social networks more and more addictive with the knowledge that this is doing on average more harm than good to the general society um but again they're not forcing anyone to be on there so they can do whatever they want it, it, but yeah and, yeah but it comes to a point it's like something gets so big that it's almost becomes a question of well almost like a moral responsibility but that's very individual and you can't attribute my morals to their morals or your morals yeah Exactly, exactly. I remember that's something, I remember, yeah, go ahead. Go no, ahead. that's okay. You remember something? No. Well, no, something that you were, uh, I think you were, I think it was from one of your uh, previous podcasts, but correct me if I'm wrong, um, which was about how you were working on not applying your own morals and standards yes. to other people's lives. I think I did, right? I think I wrote about it. Okay, fair enough. I'm I'm pretty confident. I I oh maybe maybe you wrote about it on Facebook or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I probably do, Alexander. Then I talked about it on the podcast. Anyway, it's neither here nor there. Go ahead. Yeah. 
Um, but yeah, and so I think I think that's that's you know very fitting in this specific situation mm. uh, because we all have different models and we all have different viewpoints, and it's up to the individual, I guess, to decide how to how to utilize them. Uh, but yeah, no, I think that point kind of diverging away from social media a little bit and more to that train of thought that you wrote about uh, is very interesting because uh, what I've come to experience, uh, especially over the months that we were in lockdown, you know, it was a lot of introspection, thinking, writing, and I feel I felt like I'd come to understand myself in a whole new way and kind of develop new axioms of thinking and morals to live by, uh, which to me are irrefutable. They're like, this is an excellent way to live. And this is the way I should live. And if it were up to me, I think the majority of society should live this way. Um, and it was very interesting to kind of remember what you said about that and be like, you know, maybe other people are doing their own thing and they're having a good time and I shouldn't kind of, this is the way. Yeah. Just kind of, I shouldn't pull a Mark Zuckerberg, knock on their door, put a gun to their exactly. head and tell them to win. <laughs> it's tempting though, because you, here's the thing, like we have our own perspective and like, I think and I believe and you believe that, hold on, these principles make sense. These axioms and values, yeah. I've thought about them. I've tried to see the pros and cons. I've tried to critically analyze them. I've tried to detach my bias from them. It's like this makes sense from a human nature yeah. perspective. Almost, almost objectively from right. a human nature perspective. It feels right, yeah. And I believe, yes, there are some skills and habits that – are mostly unanimous to be positive. You know, I think Robert Greene talks about them in his books, like The Laws of Human Nature, right? And I think they exist. But at the same time, it's for us to figure out for ourselves. Yeah. And what I've learned the very hard way is that don't try and put your stuff on other people. It just makes them more bogged down and more resistive. Whether it's you believe omnivore is the right way to live, both plants and meat and synergy, or you think the other way is better, or it's religion, or it's ideology, politics, or it's just simply, hey, if you clean your room and pick up one item every day and you make a more cleaner, hygienic, presentable, beautiful, aesthetic environment, your life gets better... It could be true for me and maybe true for most people if they do it. But it's like if I try and get you to do it and, and convince yeah. you this is the way, you, I think if people get further away from it. They, they want to yeah. push away. Yeah, I think that's with all of this, I think this is a, a very good example of, you know, when they say lead by example. Yeah, be the change you want uh, to see in the world. You know, exactly. And then people, you know, hopefully will see hey, you know, this guy actually knows what he's talking about. There's something here. What? And then, you know, they're like, hey, what, what are you doing? Because I want to do that. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. Uh, I, I think of the, I forget, yeah, I, I think of the, like, little parable, which uh, it's like there was the sun and the wind, and they were trying to get the jacket off, off of someone. And, uh, yeah, so the sun just was there and it was shining and then so you got to make the person willingly you got to create i think the way i saw it the way i understood it is you want to create a environment that's so nurturing for everyone else to develop and be the best individual that they can be that they would want to become that because uh and that was actually um you know something i picked up from like analyzing everything that was went on in singapore after i got back um, because it was very interesting. So to give context to everyone, just again, so we had this really big group and we were pretty conflict free, like, which is, I don't think, I don't think that's characteristic of very big groups. And we were pretty tight overall. Uh, we went to a lot of, we had dinners consistently. We went to a lot of events together. We went on vacations together. Um, and so it was very interesting to me how, like how that came to be. And I think a lot of it is, you know, we managed to uh, create this environment where people feel very comfortable and very good at coming to dinner and coming to these events and going on vacation. And because at no point did we say, all right, guys, 
you're coming to dinner and you're coming to dinner and like we would just say hey you know dinner is at eight at here and then you know most people would usually show up uh and i think that's another excellent example of just like oh there was a very good environment where people wanted willingly wanted to do what was best for the group uh maybe dinner is not the best example of that but no you know, it's, it is and, uh, yeah. I, just a little um window into behavior because i think when once people get there you want to create a positive environment right if you have to design a human behavior experiment to keep people coming back to, to those dinners you would want to create a really positive environment right how, how how did we do that naturally i think one thing we all did and it's really important in small tribes and families and friends and groups is that we found commonality between each other and we accepted each other's differences instead of judging them right yeah no i i agree i think one i don't know if you were there that one time when we were talking about c-sections and you were talking about commonalities that was really interesting to me probably unrelated i can tell you it's definitely unrelated to everything we've been talking about or to creating a nurturing environment but about like 70 percent of the people in the group were c-section really yeah is this was you don't know if i was there i would think i would have remembered that did you is this a random question or is this something you like asked in a yeah like a... Uh, i think we uh, i was talking about it with someone i was sitting next to and then someone else came in and then they were like oh i was also c-section then i posed it to the table i was like guys raise your hand if you're a c-section like so many hands came up. I was shocked. Um, were you C-section? No, natural. Oh, okay. Yeah. There you go. That's why you weren't at that dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I knew. You motherfucking C-sections. I'm going to hang out with him. I'm naturals. Yeah, that's how That's how we split up societies now. Whether... <laughs> uh, you know what? If you want to... This is this might sound controversial, but there's there's clear science and evidence to it. If you wanted to maximize evolutionary success, vitality, and health, well, you would put the natural births and the people who have been breastfed for the longest time together. They they would have the highest. I'm um, generalizing here. I'm generalizing the science here because it gets pretty specific on people who are natural birth and who are breastfed for longer. I'm talking 12 to 18 months um, plus generally have a much higher uh, rate of certain health markers, positive health markers, such mm. as gut microbiome health, okay, which then has a whole cascade of other health benefits. Um, there is links to brain cognitive development. Um, you know, I'm actually recently learning about how important breastfeeding is for the development of the jaw, okay, and that Okay, when we look, like Weston A. Price is this um, old researcher who went to different tribes and he analyzed, well, he analyzed the, the anthropometric um, differences between these modern tribes and these older tribes. And what he noticed a lot of the times was the introduction of sugar actually, and this was one of the things he measured, degraded the teeth and jaw of people Um versus the older tribes and which didn't have that and were able to have really wide open palates they were all nasally breathing mouth breathing narrows uh your windpipe and your trachea and you can't get as much air down um and so the, the act of breastfeeding you know if people are having their children one day or i'm sure we will one day you know it has so many important functions to pass and the immune system it is hugely important so that's really where the the survival thing comes into it your immune yeah. system is going to be more robust if you're breastfed for longer versus and if you're a natural birth versus the opposite and um yeah that's yeah no, that, that's, interests that, me a that, lot. that is very interesting and you know on a just a very quick side note have i don't know if you ever thought about like man if i was born a thousand years ago mm. would a hundred percent be dead by now um you dead by what dead by now you know if you what uh I was, I was trying to think like which situations in my life have i gotten into that like had i been born at the wrong time i wouldn't have like evolutionarily i'd be disregarded give me an example uh, well actually well actually there's one clear one for you yeah <laughs> with this yeah right like I mean, I can walk on the legs, so no, but no, if no. it was like a little bit worse. I mean, 
Actually, oh. no, that's a good point because the injuries. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, C section. That's an an excellent point. Before before I was born, I did like a one eighty, like a week before I was born. That's why I was C section. So I was head down, turned around, uh, and then yeah, I probably yeah would have been bad. I don't know uh, how they give births with feet first. How about uh, this one? Let's my actually go ahead. You guys, maybe it's the one I'm thinking about. Oh no, go ahead. Probably not. I was gonna bring up something else. Oh, that you're Jewish mm-hmm. and eighty years ago, fifty years ago, hundred years ago. Oh, true. Yeah, but that's not an evolutionary thing. I think that uh, actually, I guess you could say it is because that's like a societal oh, okay. thing. Oh, society okay. is very much yeah. evolutionary. If you're talking um, purely evolution, that's different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like from birth, I I fucked it up. But like I, <laughs> I wouldn't have been able to be born honestly. Like uh, if we didn't have like modern medicine and hospitals. Um, but what I was what I, what I wanted to bring up is because you know you say, um, you know, from an evolutionary perspective, you know, being breastfed and all this and all that, like from the immune system, that's better for you. Physiologically, that's better for you. Um, and this brings up a point very much linked to, you know, the logical mind to loss of the brain and, you know, this reptilian brain that we have. Why, why do we want to pass on our genes? And I know that it sounds like a very, very obvious question, uh, but I think it's, a, it's in these obvious questions that we really learn a lot of things. So for example, I would implore everyone listening to also ask themselves why they wouldn't commit murder and why they don't want to die, right? These, you know, they sound like very, very simple questions, but like, I don't think a lot of people have a really good answer to them off the bat. And so I was thinking about like, why do we want to pass on our genes? Why does it matter if, you know, we have, as, as a society, we have, you know, the best, as a species, we have the best, you know, genes for our species. Um, and I think the only answer I could come up with was, you know, evolutionarily speaking, this is what we did. And so the genes we have kind of hardwire us to want to have kids and to have good genes and to survive. Um, but if you think about it from a logical perspective, it doesn't really make much sense to me at least. Which part? Right? Like, think about everything I mentioned. So let's take something very obvious. Let's say, let's take for example, having children. Mm-hmm. I really want to have children. Um, you do? You know, at some point in my life. Yeah. Okay. At some point in my life. Um, that being said, I, I, I fully recognize that I, from like an objective point of view, if it wasn't for the chemicals in my brain, I wouldn't need children. You know, why do I feel that I need to pass on my genes to the next generation, right? Because that has nothing to do with me. I can only experience the the joy and suffering that I experience. I do not get to experience unless I'm, you know, I can be very empathetic and very sympathetic and kind of and, and take in what other people are experiencing. But ultimately, that's what I'm experiencing. And so even if I have kids, that that cannot change the way I experience joy and suffering well maybe it can change the way i feel it but i will still feel joy and suffering the way i feel joy and suffering and not the way they feel it and anyone else feels it and so it's really my own unique experience and there is no way for me to propagate myself through time i can only do that by having kids which is the closest thing to me but because i can't propagate myself through time indefinitely right i don't need kids I know this sounds very, uh, I don't know, maybe a little crazy. Um, no, it doesn't sound crazy. It just sounds deeply yeah. philosophical when I'm I'm trying to uncover the weeds and, and find. Or here, you can take this one. Try this one on for size. Uh, <laughs> so I was thinking about this the other day. Why do we feel like we uh, want to do want to go on creative endeavors and do creative things and uh, express ourselves artistically and, uh, you know, not be stuck in a cubicle in an office, but maybe do something that's, that we're more passionate about, right? Why do we even feel passion? Um, or, but more specifically, why do we want to do creative things? If our sole purpose was to pass on our genes and to, you know, have children and, you know, keep that cycle going, 
where does being creative fit into that? And so I think it's very interesting. So what's co- okay? Let's think. What is creative a byproduct of? Like what's above creativity? Like I think you can tie them. I think we try to tie everything back to survival and reproduction, but yeah, can it's everything a, it's a be very explained? easy crutch to lean on? Uh, yeah, I think it's I think tying everything back to like evolutionary psychology is an incredibly easy crutch yes. to lean on, and I think it has uh, significant you know uh, grounds as well to stand on. But uh, I do find myself leaning on it and just kind of attributing everything to that uh, mm. when uh, push comes to shove mentally. I think speaking. the thing is, we don't know a lot of the time. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah. I think you're right. I just don't want to accept that at the moment. I think we uh, find... Yeah. <laughs> well we try to attribute meaning and explanation to the unexplainable because it gives us comfort it's like conspiracy theories it's like there is an it could yeah i yeah no i i think it could definitely be just chance that you know we want to express ourselves creatively just you know that by chance we now have hands and fingers uh you know we could have been lions or some other species that never developed hands, you know, and we would have lived life, life that way. Um, you know, there nowhere in the code in evolution did it say, okay, at this point in time, they will develop appendages, right? And that just kind of happened through mutation randomly. Well, yeah. well yes, it can be random mutation. Um, it can also be the, the expression of epigenetics, which is gene expression changing on based, based on our environment. So our environment will stimulate sure, right, right, genes right, to go right. on and off depending on the stress of the environment, just the stimulus of the environment. So yeah. it's millions of years of different or the same consistent stimulus that progresses us towards whatever we become. So what yeah. would we become? If we make it, if we don't get burnt up by the sun or blow each other up, what will we become... A thousand, five thousand, ten thousand mm. years from now. That. Woo! Have you seen what Elon Musk is doing with Neuralink? Oh yeah, yeah. That was really cool, actually. Did you see the uh, recent presentation I, a couple weeks ago? Yeah, with the with the pigs. Yeah. Yes, with the pigs. Yeah, yeah. That was, uh, you know, as as uh, as a man myself, that was tough to watch, but otherwise very cool. Oh. Because pigs. <laughs> no. Um, no, it was very very cool. I think the. Uh, I had a very uh, misguided view of what it was before that presentation. What did so, you think it was? Uh, just kind of like, oh, you, you know, you connect it to to your brain, and then you're kind of just like hooked up to the internet or whatever it is. You know, your mental capacity increases by a thousand fold, and you're you become like an incredibly intelligent individual, which I'm sure could be a derivative of yeah. what Neuralink is today. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the moment, it it's uh, at least being presented as you know this piece of engineering to help with uh, certain neurological diseases, yes. uh, which I think is incredible, right? If you can help treat Alzheimer's with Neuralink, that's that's amazing. Yeah, uh, people who have like sp- serious spinal issues, they can't walk, they can't move yeah. their limbs. That's amazing, and that is the opening yeah. into how they are attacking. Um, solving human suffering through that that seems the first step oh okay yeah 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 no that like so you, solving human suffering that sounds a little scary. alleviating human that's how lex friedman yeah. who i'm not sure if you're familiar with has phrased the, their first step in Neuralink. it's like let's alleviate like if you if i told you tom i have a solution for 99 percent of all diseases and health ailments Within the within the next fifty to one hundred years, I could solve them. Right? It's like right. maybe via neural link, which will keep progressing. That gives you some confidence into how you could live your life. That's true. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's very interesting. You know, sometimes I think about because I think uh, you know we know that people are very very good at rationalizing uh, everything they do. There was actually a very fascinating paper, which, ooh, I forget ex- the author. It was Michael 
uh, I don't want to butcher his last name. Uh, yeah, okay, it's fine. Michael Gazinga or something like that. I'm sorry. Uh, but it was, he basically uh, did research on uh, people who had to have the uh, bridge, I forget the name, the bridge connecting the left and right hemisphere in their brain. Mm -hmm. the, the connection between that. They had to have that severed uh, for one reason or another. Um, and so then uh, they brought in those uh, people and did a couple of experiments on them in a very, like, didn't inject and It wasn't like some crazy horror story experiments. They were just like, okay, uh, they they uh, made it so that only one eye could see one thing, right? So they put like a divider between them or they closed one eye. Um, and so they showed the left eye, which is the right hemisphere, uh, a placard with an action, which uh, might have said something like, get up to the corner of that room and walk there. And they would. And obviously, because they don't have that link in their brain, their left hemisphere has no idea what's going on right because their right eye didn't see the card and so they get up and they start walking and they can still function completely normally physically speaking and then they're asked hey why did you get up why like why did you go there and so the left the left hemisphere is our speaking hemisphere right it's the one that controls our thoughts or logic what we say uh and so they they would say anything but that's what it said on the card it would say oh i wanted to stretch or oh, I wanted to get a coat, or oh, I saw something on the wall and I wanted to look at it. Our left hemisphere take, took in, and this was insane to me when, when I read the paper, took in the external factors that were going on that it did not understand. It had no idea why it was doing it, and it was like, fuck, guys, all right, why, why start generating reasons as to why we're doing it. What's the most probable one? I wanted to stretch. And then it's like, oh, I wanted to stretch. When really the reason they got up was it just said it on the card. It just said get up and walk there. Right, but what and so did they I forget why they got up? No, they just didn't know because their left, their right hemisphere saw it and acted upon it, and so oh. they got up and walked. But their left hemisphere, which uh, you know is our computational center for reason, speech, thought, and kind of logical thinking, uh, didn't see the card, so it didn't know why the body was getting up and walking. Interesting. Uh, I'll, I'll send you the paper after this, um, um, and. Basically, it it kind of the paper. What the paper suggests is that we as people are very very good at rationalizing our actions, even if there was no real good reason for them to begin with. Wow. And so, why am I bringing this up? Is because you know sometimes you know we look at difficult and painful situations, and even death, as all these inevitable things, and then we kind of learn to well i mean we try to learn to accept them at least some of us and we try to get the good out of them right like i i, I got this cast and i was like wow it's really interesting to see this and like that's where my mind naturally went to see how you know people look at me on the street or how it's like to walk with crutches and all that but i really wonder if at times for all of these negative experiences in our lives and all the stuff and all the points of suffering it's really just our left hemisphere rationalizing the inevitability of and understanding that, hey, you're in this city situation, let's give some good meaning to right. it. When we, and so, and so because you asked, like, if, if you could get, would have this neural link that would get rid of like 99% of human diseases, like intuitively, yes, like 100%, like, yeah, do it. But then on second thought, I was like, wow, but there are so many things to learn from like tough times. And maybe that's better for us. Uh, like. And so I think there's definitely a fine line. Uh, so That's yes, I'm on board. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely on board with... Uh, so on record, yes, get rid of human diseases. Uh, but I think uh, there is an amount that we can learn from negative experiences. And then what I'm thinking is, I wonder if that learning is really just our left brain kind of rationalizing. Whereas if we didn't have those negative experiences to begin with, and our left brain didn't rationalize, then we would just see them as flat out negative and they would be objectively bad. I gotta breathe on that one. <laughs> that is a was it, yeah, that was a bit. can of worms. Huh. Rationalizing. Right. So I don't I yeah. Let me just go on record. I don't want people to suffer unnecessarily at all. I'm not for that at all. And it's the crazy thing because 
some of the most interesting, successful people have gone through huge bouts of involuntary pain and suffering. And so if you take that or at least provide the opportunity for people to solve their pain and suffering so quickly and rapidly without really viscerally feeling it and letting it embody them and learn something from it and change their character and being, what do we create on the other side of that? Yeah. It's cheat codes. Cheat codes. Cheat for life. codes. Neuralink yeah. ever... is a cheat code. Whoa. <laughs> That's yeah. That that should be their slogan. They can market that really well. Neuralink cheat code for life. Um, That's it. I mean, the, I mean, you played you played video games when you were younger. Mm-hmm. Um, did you did you ever? You know, I know I remember when I was uh, uh, a kid. Uh, I was playing. I we would play GTA San Andreas with my brother and my Love cousin that. all yeah. the time. Every Friday we would meet up and we would just, but we would hammer it with cheat codes, like because that was the only game we had. And so after like the first couple of weeks of actually playing it. We would play this for probably at least two years, like every Friday. Um, we would pump it with cheat codes, and then eventually it just got very boring. Yeah. Uh, did you have? Did you, I don't know if you ever played games with cheats, but I think it is would temporarily have the really exciting. It's acutely. Yes. It's like boom, boom, boom. Social media, dopamine, sugar donuts, cake. Uh, give it all, right? Then it gets real uninteresting and boring after that, real quick. Yes, very quickly. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, I think there's just like a point of negative returns when it comes to suffering, which at that point, I think it's very, it might be very good if we were able to magically alleviate them. Yeah. For example, if I could take my cast off right now, that would be fantastic, right? But the fact that I had it on for two weeks, I really learned a lot from it. And if we could magically get rid of COVID right now, incredible. Um, and actually, COVID is a very interesting example because... We need it. Yeah. I, I Like, I wonder if we needed it. You know, I. it's just that there was so much suffering no. that I feel like... We need it. I really believe yeah. we need it, man. Our society has... A Western world, modern society, has grown soft. And I'm not talking about areas stricken with poverty or ghettos of different areas or, or um, you know... I'm not talking about those places that are already experiencing their own pain and suffering. I'm talking about... The wealthy, affluent, you know, middle class, even lower middle class, upper class areas of the world in Western countries that are living under democracies, things have been pretty damn good for the last multiple decades, right? Our generation. We yeah. haven't really we haven't experienced the war. I mean, America went, went to war with Iraq um, in the early 2000s and the 90s, but... We haven't really experienced a global or a countrywide systemic fuck you pain and suffering. And it teaches you, it humbles you, and it makes, if there's one thing that I've expressed more in my life than in this last year, is gratitude. There you go. Let's uh, let's actually talk about that because I think gratitude is is incredibly important. How did you... uh... Talk to me about your gratitude journey. So, a couple of years ago, barely spoke the word, right? Didn't even viscerally understand it. Didn't speak it. Whatever. It's just a emotion I didn't feel that much. Now, over the last year, being stimulated from a friend of mine, a health professional friend of mine as well, who I have a lot of respect about in this podcast, Jordan Potts, he mentioned on a podcast I did with him, that he does a three-point gratitude journal every morning and he gets his clients, some of his clients and kids to do it as well. So I'm like, hmm, let me try that. And I started doing it because I respect him a lot and I know he's he's an amazing human being, so let me help myself get a bit more better. I started doing it and I've been doing three points every morning, every day. And what I started noticing as well is I didn't just do it in the moment like I did it every morning. One... It's, imagine the first feeling, one of the first feelings you feel, instead of it let it being something on the news you saw or, or emails or the cascade of crazy human emotion that you can experience on your phone or computer, 
Imagine if one of the first emotions you felt was positivity and gratitude and how that can anchor you for the day. So that, I noticed, was hugely beneficial to me for my well-being because I can st- how, I, how you start a task, how you start something, I think it can be very beneficial to gaining momentum for the day. So one, I'm starting with three points. I go outside, I get direct sun, I'm stacking these great habits together. Then what I started noticing is I started speaking about my gratitude more in my speech. I started expressing gratitude for friends and myself and just out loud in conversation. Like I'm grateful, like I'm gonna put in my thing tomorrow, I'm grateful to know and have friends like Tom who I can have open, honest conversations with and, and philosophically and psychologically challenge myself. Like I'm grateful for that, you know? So I started noticing those things. And then I started noticing when I spoke of gratitude to the people that I cared about, but the relationships got a bit deeper and and they connected a little bit more and I felt a little bit better about them. And so just from that one habit that began, three points, five minutes, three minutes every morning, a cascade of improved well-being and connections with the people that I care about. Wow. Cost me nothing. Go. Except for time. But it's worth it. <laughs> Absolutely, because that's an investment. But it's worth it. It gets a yeah, disproportional investment it. returns. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's right. I. Uh, Why do you ask? Have you played with it? What do you think? With gratitude? Mm. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, uh, I, I, for, for many years, I didn't have like a, a conscious uh, relationship with it. But I remember uh, I was, uh, I was, consistently surrounded by uh you know reminders of hey be grateful it's so much better to be grateful you know uh look at what's good in your life and i think that really kind of seeped into my my way of thinking um to the point where you know i forget exactly when it was um i'm very bad with remembering when things were in the past um but i want to say maybe probably when i started listening to the tim ferris show uh was about four years ago, um, where I got much more directly in contact with it. And uh, I also, uh, you know, uh, started practicing it a little bit more uh, actively. Um, I, I never did the uh, three point journal or five minute journal uh, in the morning. And I know the five minute journal also has a couple points like what am I grateful for? And what was I grateful for today? Um, I never actively did that. But uh, it was uh consistently kind of like a back thought of not even that conscious but more of hey you know like wow i remember in singapore one day i i forget if it was when i woke up or before i went to sleep you know i just i i was looking at my hand it just kind of like came into sight and i was like oh my god i'm moving my fingers i have a hand like this is incredible like this is amazing that i like you know it's just like that deep cerebral feeling of, wow, this is, look at all these things I have and all these things I can be happy with. And I just think that, you know, the alternative is not being happy with it and being sad about it or looking at the bad things. And that, I just, I tried that as well, not willingly. It just kind of happened in life. You can start looking at the negatives and you don't get anything good out of it. Uh, At least I didn't. and with this, you just feel good. You feel good. And I think if anything, if you're not having children, then feeling good, I think, is the next best alternative. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. I was like, yeah, I see what you did there. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's like you want, I think what we were talking about earlier in the conversation is that you want, what was it? Earlier on in the conversation, it's like, I want to feel like the things that I'm doing are purposeful, they have meaning, like I'm not. Like, I'm doing things that I want to do. That's what I'm trying to say. I want to do things I want to do, Tom. You want to do things I want to do, right? I I don't want to have to live a life where I feel like I'm living a bunch of obligations and I'm chasing my tail, doing things for everybody else, living other people's dreams and ambitions. Not only do I want to do what I want to do, I want to enjoy my life and I want to enjoy the things I do. And so it's this very simple concept of doing what I want to do and enjoying what what I do. And if you can find those two and stick them together and you can feel those motions of gratitude in the midst of it, wow, what a life. Then you made it. Yeah, because, and, and I mean, you don't, 
you don't need anything else, right? Uh, I think I think it just takes a lot of hard, you know, almost physical mental labor, right? So it's not obviously it's not physical labor, but like mentally, it's a very very difficult and long process, um, you know. And I think you know some people are very lucky in that they really take joy in analyzing themselves and in you know trying to understand how they operate. Um, and I think a lot of people just don't. And then, and then this kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier as well, which is like not imposing our views and our opinions and our, you know, axioms of thought onto other people because maybe the way they're doing it, they're also just as happy, but we just are operating on a different platform where they, ex they experience happiness differently than we do. Does that make sense? Yeah, and that's okay. That's the accepting yeah. Yeah, that's, that other yeah, people exactly. are on different roads and paths and we can both get to yeah. a similar destination. Exactly, exactly. And yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know how your experience has been as well, uh, but I think a lot of people, and I've used this example in my thinking as well, uh, you know, kind of strive for a lot of money. Uh, and they, they want to be as rich as they can be for no apparent reason other than I want to be very rich. Uh, and it was it's very interesting if you have someone like that that you know. Uh, I think it's a very interesting uh, exercise to just ask them a couple questions and try to, you know, pinpoint, like a ask them very probing questions about why they want to do what they're doing and why they want to be very rich. And... A lot of the times you'll find that those particular people don't really have a, a better answer than, oh, I just want that boat, man. I just really want that boat or I really want that big house. Um, or I want the, and you know, some people might say, oh, I want the, um, the respect and the, uh, you know, the feeling of achievement. They use it as a, as a benchmark. Like I'm, I'm, I made it because they use that as their benchmark for success. Um, and I think once you really go into that introspective thought and you really start looking into, especially with gratitude, uh, you realize that it's really the people in your life that are, you know, the makers or the breakers of it. Yeah, um, absolutely. And of course, it's and, and also yourself, you're being your own person as well, uh, which, you know, full circle, I think, again, that's because of our reptilian brain and i think that's you know maybe that's a beautiful part of it yeah uh, but i think connecting connecting with people is such an important byproduct of this life so mm. i don't want it just to be about achievement but money i used to be that guy just i want money i just want to give me a right. million dollars and aston martin dbs so i can roll up and impress people it's like that used to be me but now my priorities are way different but i recognize that and i hear heard this that money is like oxygen when you don't have oxygen you're starving yes. it's like i can't breathe i can't breathe yeah. yeah but when you have it you don't notice it if you can do what you want you can function you have it yeah. You're fine. Yeah. Yeah. But money, it's like... Money is definitely an important commodity to access financial... Access certain freedoms and opportunities in this life. And um, yes. Yes. I value it highly. I, I agree. And let me just... I was also that person as well. You know, mm -hmm. like, until I really started looking deep into myself. Like... So being successful meant being a multimillionaire. Yeah. That's what successful was. Yeah. And like, if you weren't that, you weren't successful. Like, it was really black and white and as easy as that. And so what what I strove for was, hey, you know, as, I guess as like a 17-year-old is to be super and incredibly rich. Um, and I definitely agree with you that, you know, mon you can money, think of it as oxygen, is a very good metaphor. But it, and I think... You can take it further if you kind of incorporate it with uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? You you need money to kind of fulfill the first couple steps, right? To get shelter, to get food, to get sleep, um, you know, to feel safe, 
you need money for all those things. But once you get past that, okay, so now you have enough money to establish those things, you know, all the higher steps of, until like up to self-actualization require other people until the very last step, which is, you know, self-actualization. But it's like having an intimate relationship, you know, having a community. Those are the next steps. And you don't need money for that. And so there's definitely a point where once you have enough, you have enough. And I think it's just very difficult to know, hey, I have enough. Or I'm happy. Because maybe, maybe, okay, so obviously, so let me kind of lead in with my, the context I, I'm, I'm thinking of it as is because I studied economics and I'm doing my master's in finance. And one thing I'm worried about is that, and this happens a lot within the world of finances, you know, they have, you know, the paychecks are very attractive. And a lot of people really don't like their jobs, but they stay in the loop mm. because you know, they're like, I'm not going to give up 150 grand this year just to get out of finance. Like you get, or not even right. Like in it's insane amounts of money, not at like my age, just as like a grad, but you know, later on. Uh, and so I keep telling myself like, Hey, listen, man, you know, don't let that, you know, know when you've had enough and, you know, back out or don't get in there to begin with if you don't enjoy it, just like see if you like it or not. Um, and so I think, yeah, I, I, so you, I guess that- You have to know yeah. what's important to you. You gotta know what values yeah. are important to you. Like, what do you want from this life? What do you wanna be able to create? What do you be able to wanna do? What freedoms do you wanna have, be able to achieve? Like, some people wanna buy an island. Some people wanna Jeffrey Epstein this bitch and buy an island, right? And, and have all types of weird business go along there, right? Some people, mm. They just want a white picket fence, a nice home, and a couple of children, and a dog, right? There's a big difference between those two, and there's all this stuff in the middle. And so it's like, what do you want to be able to do with your life? Do you want to, like, what's become quite, uh, apparent to me in this time is that, huh, what I was quite impressed and inspired by someone like Joe Rogan is that California is quite messed up in a lot of ways, right? From homelessness to taxes to um, all the... the politics and questionable decision making that are happening within their state what he's done is in a in the matter of a month he decided agreed with his family and moved from california he's been there for over a decade to texas right he he moved all his shit he's like he's living now in texas right all in a matter of a month and when people think about moving homes to a different country or a different state they think, oh my god, that's such a big decision. It's so burdensome. I gotta do this. Do I have enough money? Blah, blah, blah. Whatever. I this time has made me think. I'm, why don't Why don't I just go up to Queensland or New South Wales and go live there for a couple months or a, a year and just let this stuff mellow down? I'm just like, oh, oh, okay. That quickly becomes apparent to me what type of lifestyle and, and situation that I have to create for myself in order to create that with such effective, quick decision-making. And so, do you want that? Do I want that? Does the person listening want to do something like that? Well, that requires certain financial situation. Right, 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 right. I uh, I can definitely relate. I was, uh, yeah, you definitely, I, I, I was definitely on the same boat literally thinking why don't i just move to like place x just pick up just get my things and go you know um and it was very interesting to confront all these you know you might maybe you want to call them weaknesses or uh things that you place on yourself that restrict you and keep you where you are um to see that in myself right because you normally don't think about those things and really at the end of the day when i rolled it all away it was just fear I was just afraid. Um, and so that was that was really, really interesting. Uh, I wanted to uh, mention something with regards to that. Uh, but it's slipping, it's slipped my mind. Uh, yeah. On another note. Oh, yes, I remember. So I think uh, I, I don't know if you've heard of Derek Sivers. Uh, yeah, I, he, I just yeah. emailed him the other day to get him on my podcast. Oh, no way. Yes, awesome. I hope. He's doing that. I hope you get him on. Dude, end, that's awesome. End of the year. Awesome. Did he get back? Oh, I guess you just emailed him. He's a so. great guy. Yeah. Like, we've talked on He's and off incredible. over the email. Like, he, he, he you heard him yeah. from Tim Ferriss? Yes. He's an amazing human being. Amazing. I am, uh, I almost don't want to say I'm a big fan of him, of his. 
uh, because that would be wrong to him. Uh, like yeah. uh, he's just, you know, I think it's he's it, someone you can really learn a lot from, um, and just kind of. A- anyway, so that's so Derek Sivers. Look him up if you don't know him. Uh, he's he's great. He also has an incredible uh, book review uh, list on his website, which I found some amazing books on there uh, that I've really enjoyed reading and have been very very useful. That's beside the point. Anyways, uh, so I was um, listening to him the other day, and he was talking about how you know when you want to do something. So for example, maybe move, just get up and go to go to Brisbane, whatever you want to do. Um, it was very interesting because he said, "Listen, maybe you, what you might want to do first is find someone who was in a similar situation as yourself and is doing what you want to be doing now, and see if you actually." If that's actually what you want to be doing is that totally is that person living the life that you actually want to live because i think a lot and a lot of and this is what he said you know don't maybe i'm misquoting him but uh from the way i understood it is that a lot of us have like these fantasies of this would just you know if only this that would be incredible if i only picked up all my stuff and i moved to florida my life would be amazing not that i thought that but just as an example uh but then once you get up and you buy that house or you move to Florida or, you know, you move out to the country, that's the example he used, you're not, you realize that, oh, wait, there were so many things in the city that I really liked. That, that was the example he used. And so I think, yeah, I think it's also very important to keep that in mind for anyone thinking about making a big change or a big move. Find someone who did that. Totally. I think that's good advice. And then just like see, yeah. Let's go further. What are we going to say? Because I believe in this so much because I, man... So many people go through degrees, right? And like we're all, most people are, are do this. They find something they're interested in and they start studying it. Cool. I think that's a fucked up order because you're studying something you're interested in, but interest is not the same as the practicality of doing the profession. So if you want to become a doctor, you can become a financial advisor, or you become like my field. A health professional, okay? A lot of people do exercise science degrees because they want to become a personal trainer and coach and work in elite sport and they have never stepped inside of the world of a coach or trainer or high performance manager and they do not know what it's like to work in professional sport. I did a internship at a professional sporting club, Melbourne, Melbourne United. It's like the NBL is our professional basketball, right? It's like the NBA of, of Australia. And... I did. I was fortunate and, and uh, to earn that position there, and I quickly realized that the elusive fantasy that so many people have of working professional sport. I, I I was there for about five six months, and I realized very quickly I do not want to do this. I don't want to work in professional sport. It was an amazing opportunity. I learned a lot. Blah blah blah. Great, but if only people realized if you went to actually work and go do an internship or do a work experience. All high school students do work experience at a certain job, right? If only you get that experience, then maybe you will have a reality check of whether this is something you really want to dedicate tens of thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of hours of your life towards. Yeah. I believe in that so much. Definitely. You know, yeah, no, you, uh, you didn't have me in the beginning, but you have me now. Uh, Because, what part? You said, yeah, no, you said, uh, you said, you know, they find something they're interested in and then they go study it. That's a fucked up order. I'm like, no, what? They find something. But no, I get what you're saying. <laughs> um, I, I, I guess I kind of painted yeah. it in a clickbait yeah. way. <laughs> <laughs> no, fair. Uh, yeah. No, I think I think you raise a really good point. Uh, I think practically it's very difficult to... Uh, to Do all high school students in Australia have to get work experience? From exactly. when I came yeah, up, I they were all offered the opportunity, and it's a, it's a pretty, it's a forced thing. Like you, you have to find some type of work experience very in like year eleven. Very cool. That's very cool. Is that not yeah, the same so with you? No. No, no, not at all. That's true. Um, it is, it is. But yeah, no, I think, uh, I think that's. I I can agree more. Definitely, you know, try it out. See if you actually like it before you fully commit one hundred percent of everything uh, to what it is. Uh, couldn't agree more. Very cool. I'm very happy that you emailed Derek about getting on the podcast. That's super cool. He uh, is such a nice guy. He'll respond to your emails. Uh, there was a period of yeah. time he was responding to no emails. Now he's got a book out. He's writing another book. Um, yeah. And I've been going 
quite hard. I've been going. Uh, I've been emailing a lot of people uh, about getting right. them on my podcast. I'm just trying. I'm like, I'm doing the you know, get a thousand no's to get to a yes type mentality. I'm like, everybody I'm interested in now that I see on the internet that I see, like the guys from Neuralink. I watch that full hour presentation. I'm like, I emailed them. I was like, I want to speak to mm-hmm. you, right? Most of the time, people don't respond or they say no, but yeah. sometimes, sometimes they say yes. Yeah, that's why that's why I waited five times. Alexander messaged me five times, no response. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> until I said yeah. Uh, Not to you, to everyone it, else. Uh, wasn't wasn't like that at all. So just to uh, just to kind of like uh, I guess this is more for me than, but I guess also for your uh, hundred your thousand true fans. So now, uh, like this podcast, right? So you're obviously taking that very seriously. And like, this is a, uh, and I guess it's kind of like building on the Alexander Sandalis brand. Uh, yeah, well, I don't take, I try not to, I don't know what take it seriously means. I, I just want to talk to people. Okay. Fair enough. Fair That's enough. It. So where are you, so where are you splitting your time up now? Like, cause you're obviously a very busy man. Where does, you know, no white spaces on your Google calendar. Where does your time go? What do you, sp- what do you spend most of your time doing? So it's distributed in a number of ways um, from, let me break it down. There's a self-care, you know, taking care of myself component. And that's yep. food, nutrition, uh, re- training. You know, I'm doing some type of physical activity every single day, weight training, or I just got an echo bike, so I'm on that. Um, so that's an important part of my routine. Um, there is an education component into it. We're a learning component where it's I'm reading or I'm looking at research and literature and I'm summarizing and note taking that. That's a, that's a, that's a big part of my my days. I'm listening to things and I'm learning and taking note of that, whether it be podcasts or um, lectures. And then there's actual lectures through studying. You know, I, I study uh, like through tertiary education through university. So that is ongoing, um, and that's takes up time. You know, I'm coaching. And I'm teaching, yeah. so I'm coaching my clients, and then I'm teaching my students through the Cert 3 and 4 in fitness t- so they can become personal trainers and coaches. And then mm-hmm. I have a podcast and the business yeah. I own, which is also the same business that delivers these Cert 3s and 4s, you know, and so we're going through a whole business restructuring now and becoming our own registered trade organization, and that probably doesn't make sense to most people. Don't worry about it. We're just trying to become better. We're trying to level up. And... Um, then there's other side businesses like this personal brand of mine. I got another side business where I, 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 uh, I sell, it's like uh, photographs and posters that I've taken and just as like a little side business that I've had for years. Um, I did not know about that one. That's very cool. It's, it run, it's autonomous. It runs itself in the background. It does, I don't really do much to it, um, but it's a, it's nice way people can get creative po- uh, work that I've created just through like things I've taken or things I've created into posters not all of it's my work some of it's taken from music and hip hop um, but and then there's a uh, family and relationship and friends you know so that's yep. that's where most of my time is among those oh I'm teaching yoga now as well I'm doing uh, I'm doing um zoom yoga every week now so i've just started doing from people's requests so it sounds like a lot i just listed like seven things but it's it's really systematized and it's like all put in like this goes here this goes here it's like i manage it so that's a fucking long ass explanation of what the fuck i do no i mean and i think that's i i think that's a very healthy kind of busy as well right because uh, I was thinking about it the other day, and I think there's a very unhealthy busy, busy, which is the busy where you're working 12 hours a day for you know at some company that you really don't like, and <clears throat> just that one pillar of your life, work, is taking maybe 80% of your time to anything else from it from everything else, um, and so you're obviously very busy, but it's the busy of maintaining and managing 
several pillars of your life that are very important. So, you know, work, relationships, yourself, um, and uh, business, businesses. The business, yeah, yeah. He's cool. And education, yeah. and education, which I guess so. There's definitely overlap, right? Yourself and education, right? You definitely there's definitely some overlap there. Work and your own business, definitely some overlap there. Um, and also like your relationships, also very good for you, hopefully. Absolutely. And so, <laughs> and so, uh, I think there's definitely a distinction to be made between uh, like healthy busy and unhealthy busy, almost kind of within food, which I think. Uh, I only recently came to understand, and I think uh, it would be very useful for people to make that distinction. Uh, so, well, you want to, for me, I don't think it's smart to put all your eggs in one basket, I, I, unless you're an outlier, unless, like I did that when I was younger, all I wanted to do was play basketball at the highest level. All eggs in one basket, mission. Right. Mission A, no plan yeah. B, go, yeah. execute. And there's pros to that, it's cons to that. For now, I like a lot of shit, so I'm gonna do a lot of shit. And it doesn't feel like, most of the time, it doesn't feel like a burden because I'm choosing to do it. It can be stressful at times because I'm like, ah, oh, I've stretched myself pretty thin here. Um, I've got a lot of stuff on. But most of it, if not all of it, is things I want to do. So if you can find that for yourself, um, there's this quote, do not mistake activity for achievement. Do not mm. mistake busyness for achievement. It's like people just feel like they're doing something. Ooh, yeah. just, and I've done that. Yeah. Oh, man. It's like, are you? is what you're doing really... Like, is, is what reading this thing or watching this thing or doing this thing, is that really going to move you forward? Or is that really productive right. in any way? Or is it purposeful? Right. Do you really want to do it? Or is it just something to do? Yeah. 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 No, I agree. Uh, it was... For those interested, read the four-hour work week. I think it's very heavily explored there. The kind of maybe not heavily, but definitely discuss the uh, the empty the em the empty busy kind of just like doing something to make yourself feel like you're getting somewhere, where in reality you're kind of standing still. Um, yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, but uh, that reminded me of another thing, which is uh, I can't remember right now. I don't know what's hitting me. Uh, but we'll keep on talking and I'll, hopefully I can remember it. Uh, but I agree. I agree. I, and I think, you know, you say, you know, not putting all your eggs in one basket. I think that's definitely one way to look at it. But I think from another perspective, it's just like, you know, there are pillars in, at least in my life. And I think in most people's life that need to be maintained, right? Like you, I think need to be maintained, right? And we need to understand the goal. It, it always depends on what your goal is. If your goal is to live a happy, healthy, and good life, then I think, necessary element of that is to maintain a good family relationship good social relationship healthy productive work relationship and a very good relationship with yourself yeah. uh and do various for myself it's various creative things and also maintenance things um to make sure i'm up with myself to live a happy and healthy life well, what were you doing what where was the situation where you were like oh i used i was just being busy instead of being maybe purposeful uh, ooh. um because you said you recently changed think, it yeah or realized uh well so well what i what i recently realized was the uh the distinction of busy of being unhealthy busy which for me is being busy with one pillar in your life one or two okay as opposed to healthy busy which you're spending a good amount of time on each pillar maintaining it and building it um uh, but i think for me definitely in university in the first couple of years maybe uh, I may have been doing some, I may, may have been doing some things, working towards some assignment, but it really, I, like deep down, I knew that I wasn't making real progress on it, but I felt like I put the hours in. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I, I think, I think actually on a, on a, on a greater context, taking degrees and tertiary education as a really good example, but it doesn't have to be that it can be your work or it can be high school or it can be whatever a very very good cover to make yourself feel good and i think this works beautifully into why exchange was so much fun for me uh and such a good social learning environment into how people behave and how things interact on a social pool table you know if you hit this ball what's going to happen 
uh, is because everyone was under the guise of, I am working towards my degree. I'm being productive right now. I am getting this. I'm, I'm, I'm moving forward, man. Uh, while at the same time, they got that for free, as in the amount of pressure they had on themselves from an education standpoint was far reduced compared to what they had back home. Because for most people, it was a pass-fail system as opposed to the grades they actually get. So all they needed to do was, well, get them do the minimum amount of effort uh, and pass the course, which gave them a lot of free time. Uh, and so I think this is exactly what we're talking about, just on a greater context. And I think people might have the same thing with work. They feel like they're working and they're doing something really good, but they're really not putting in a lot of effort and a lot of energy into it. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. It, interesting, especially relevant to the pass fail system and how that allowed people to be are more unburdened and more free to, to make decisions and put their energy into other pillars. Um, yeah. which we did like socially and, and traveling and uh challenging and i yourself. think the key is uh while still feeling like they're being productive i think that's very important uh because you know if you go through periods of lack of activity and you don't feel like you're working towards anything you really start to feel down you start to feel bad like imagine going on exchange but like strip education you're just in singapore for five months right You've give you've you've left all your, all your clients back home. You're not working towards your degree. You're just in Singapore for five months. After a while, I would start feeling very bad. I, I would feel like I'm not working towards anything. You got to right? find something. Humans, we need. I believe we need something to challenge us. Something to mm -hmm. express. Our, it's like something to harden. No, how do I say? Like. It's like a hammer hitting against a stone. We need the stone to hit against. Right, 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 right. Yeah, I guess I guess you could, another way you could put it is like, we need meaning and we need to generate meaning for ourselves. Meaning, yes, and, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and so I think, because for a long time I was thinking like how, because exchange is such a bubble. So for anyone who didn't go on, on study exchange in while they were at university, uh, just to give you like a little bit of context so you know what's going on, it's just like this little period of time where you go to a different country with a lot of that you may have never been to before with a lot of people who may have also not been there before, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of things that you don't know, and you're just kind of there together, and uh, then you kind of get to live a very uh, almost ecstasy version of life. Not ecstasy in the sense that it's like amazing, which for me it was, but it, in the sense that it's just very different, but similar in core values to regular life. But it's very much a bubble, if that makes sense, right? Do, do you know what I'm talking about? It is a bubble. When I say, when I say bubble, yeah, it's like it's not it's not a good representation of what normal life is like. No, like you living. Cannot sustain. Yeah. Oh yeah 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 you, yeah, you can't yeah. yeah that's that the sustaining life, also in that way, but also like. If you lived in the city, you'd have a different experience as well compared to living on campus and exchange. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And so all, all that comes together. And I was thinking for a long time, like, it's such a unique experience that I really don't think any of us will ever get to experience again. Mm. Because there, there are several factors that had to come just right for you to be able to experience it that way. And I think one factor of paramount importance is the feeling of uh, pseudo productivity which was, I feel... Pseudo-productivity. He's out.
Bro, I'm gonna I'm giving you a hard job with the editing. <laughs> hey, it's, it wouldn't be life yeah. without uh, struggles and hiccups. So that's right. That's why I say cancel Neuralink. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you just start a fucking petition. You uh, were saying no. the words feelings of pseudo productivity. Yes. Yes, and I think that so it's and I I think that's exactly what we were talking about. It's kind of the empty productivity, right? You feel like you're working towards something, but you're really not. Uh, so I think yeah, maybe pseudo productivity is a good way to put it. Um, and in the specific context of exchange, I think that's a very necessary element for exchange to be as good of an experience as it can be. Yeah, to be free, uh, because to liberate exactly. Because if you if you stripped all your responsibility and everything you needed to do. You would feel bad because you didn't have any responsibility and you didn't, you know, have any burden to kind of that you're trying to alleviate um, or work towards or you know improve whatever it is. Uh, but if it, you had the exact same amount of responsibility that you had back home or even more, then that wouldn't work either because you'd have to focus on it just as much, if not more. And so feeling like you have that responsibility and that you are, are working towards something, but really you don't have to. Uh, Attribute as much time to it, and it gives you the liberty to do all these various things under the guise of feeling good that you're working towards something. I think is the secret to why exchange is such a good experience for so many people. That is a really interesting analysis and reflection upon why a student should experience exchange. And I think, unless that's a good part, place to close. The conversation, Tom. I don't know if you realize. Sure. Yeah. We've been going for over two and a half hours now. Oh man, that's that's longer than most of my talks. <laughs> yeah. So we are two hours and fifteen. We are we've gone deep in the philosophical and psychological weeds. Do you have any, bro? We could talk for. We could make this five hours, right? Yeah. I Part two. That. We will. We will. In the cut, leave it in the comments, guys. <laughs> Do you have any last comments, thoughts, parting, asks of our audience? Anything you wanted to say, get off your chest, mm. or ask? Oh, bro, I feel like I'm on Tim Ferriss. This is making me I got jittery. That, I got that yeah. from him because I thought that's such yeah. a nice way to close the conversation. Instead yeah. of always just, where can people find you? It's like, people know. They'll Google your name. Yeah. But like, that's true. people usually have things that they want to say. So I really, I get a lot of my inspiration or not inspiration, but like I have naturally, like you become your environment. And so I have mm -hmm. learnt how to behave from guys like Tim Ferriss and Joe Rogan. Um, yep. I think my style is like a mesh of the two when trying to communicate with people. So, and I think Tim's a phenomenal at asking really great questions but joe is so great at creating a laid-back open conversational environment and um mm -hmm. those things resonate with me deeply so that's why i ask there you go no excellent question no i think they're both really good sources of inspiration and i, I think it's very interesting that uh you I, first of all really good to take those two podcasters and kind of try to use them as inspiration because they're both excellent so very Good, good, uh, good on that part. Uh, any parting thoughts and ideas? Um, you know, it's uh, you do you. You know, to like live your life, but like live try try to live a good life. Analyze it, look into it, be be happy. Uh, you know, uh, just be critical of, of, of what you're doing and and how you approach different uh, scenarios. Uh, and you know, you're living this life. Uh, and if we go back to the beginning, you only got so much time. Yeah. Uh, I think, oh, you know, actually, we didn't get to talk about this. And I think this is some, a great thing to leave it on is um, in Singapore, I took a class about, you know, bereavement and death. And I think that gave me incredible amounts of insight about life. And every single day that I went to that class, after the class, I felt incredible. And it wouldn't be morbid and it wouldn't be sad. It would just be talking about, you know, death rituals or, you know, the way people handle death in modern society and different cultures around the world. And it just gave me such a succinct and clear feeling of exactly what I had to do in my life or on that particular day or something I was struggling with. 
So I would really encourage people to explore that a little bit more in a in a very healthy way. You know, to realize our mortality and and to realize and you know maybe you know imagine some scenarios in your mind, uh, and it might help give you some clarity. So I think I'd leave it there. I definitely want to talk about that next time. Definitely make a note of that. Yeah, yeah. I shame that I forgot. I will. I will write that down. Well, we talked about so much. So we, we, yeah, there it ain't enough time to talk about all the stuff in this crazy world. That's true. That's true. But this will be the first of many conversations. There is. Uh, there is. This will be the first of many conversations. Is uh, what I was going to say. Uh, I was hoping to do this in person with you, um, but with the state of everything, right. because I know you love Australia. Um, I just thought, yeah. let's just get this done. Let's chat. Let's do it. Let's do it. Yeah. Hopefully, we will get to do it in person. Oh, we day. will. No matter yeah. of time. Yeah. When when the borders open up, I'm there. Absolutely, Mr. Parat. Much love. Can't wait to do this again. Right back at you. Yeah. All the best, man. Appreciate you Thank doing you very this. Much. Talk yeah. soon. You are watching, talking, or listening to talking chimps. Do you expect us to behave? Do you expect a chimp to behave in a zoo? And how are you going to expect us to behave? We're in a fucking zoo. It's called the fucking planet. Spinning around in a marble, hurling through space, wondering when the fuck we're going to get off this ride. Never. We're stuck. And we're in a Milky Way, which is in another universe, in another universe, in another universe, in another universe.